presumes that financing is involved. Pants have to go in the laundry now. What's that? Pants have to go in the laundry. I dropped some pizza on go. One of my favorite things is that he's been able to getting the end of the paving project right beyond his driveway. Yeah. It turns out it's the town line. But. Yeah. <laughs> that would something complete. I hadn't noticed that. I was. That's where the they finished paving this year. Yeah. Just, 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 I knew it was... Yeah. 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 At first, when I saw it, I'm like, oh, dick. Yeah. Yes, use the mic Not here for good. sure, please. Yeah. I insist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or else. Yeah. So it's going to be a... Sorry, Mike, you're just not there. I don't have anything to say. You're just not there. It's not important anymore, Mike. It doesn't count anymore. Yeah. First speech was... And, like, city center in Burlington, that's it. Financing, problems. Do you think this will be easy unless the agenda suggests? Is it one of these ones? Yeah. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. It says short and uh, forever. <laughs> Is everybody who wants to be in here in here? Scott, are you ready? Tell us. Should let Matthew go and shuffle. <laughs> hmm? I think you should let Matthew go home and shuffle. <laughs> yeah. No, poor guy. I know. <laughs> True. He's probably liking the. No, uh, good evening. Uh, we're going to uh, start the third uh, MPO training session of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, and uh, Eleni will start off. Yep. Yeah. So today we're just going to go uh, over uh, a little bit more deeper dive onto the work that we do here at the CCRPC, our new government program. Uh, we're going to talk about the major categories that we have, uh, you know, we work in. And also then we're going to shift gears a little bit and actually address the question and the comment that we got last, uh, in the last session of how does, uh, you know, uh, project becomes a project and how does it go through the planning, design, permitting, all the way to construction. So we're going to just talk a little bit about that process and also provide some examples. So Marshall is going to start us with uh, some uh, information about the UWP and then we'll, before actually we go there, maybe we can all introduce, the staff will introduce themselves. So you guys know us, so I'm going to start the Lenny Churchill. Marshall Bissell, uh, transportation planner here. Sai Sarapali, transportation planning engineer. Christine Ford. Jason Shrest. Brian Davis. Chris Dubin. Great. Thank you. Not transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Forrest Cohen. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Marshall is going to start us off. All right. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, so our unified planning work program was briefly uh, addressed in our previous board training sessions. Uh, but, but as sort of a refresher, uh, the UPWP is a, uh, this federally mandated document uh, that, that serves as the annual work program for our local and regional uh, planning activities and transportation planning <coughs> projects. Uh, it's also used to uh, implement the eco strategies for our region also to help our municipalities move forward with their local plans. So basically each year we solicit project requests from municipalities, uh, partner organizations, and the public on how we should uh, invest public funds towards transportation and other planning programs in Chittenden County. So some examples of project requests would be corridor and scoping studies, uh, transportation related stormwater planning, uh, land use planning assistance and also a variety of other technical assistance requests. So after we receive all these project requests, we have a UPWP committee that meets in January, February, and March uh, to kind of best decide how we should allocate our funds towards these projects. So corridor studies. Uh, so corridor studies involve this sort of comprehensive assessment of transportation and land use conditions throughout the length of a, an entire transportation corridor. Uh, so these include uh, the development of a vision and goals, uh, conducting public outreach, and really just evaluating uh, multimodal strategies to address issues related to safety, 
uh, congestion and other transportation issues. Um, so we are uh, we're also sort of looking to get more involved with corridor management planning in general. So that essentially means we're going to be working more with VTrans to coordinate and, and leverage investments by merging uh, new improvement projects with traditional maintenance activities. Um, one other thing to note is it's uh, it's fairly common that after a corridor study, uh, a recommendation would be to follow up with a, a more focused scoping study, which I'll get into <coughs> in a few slides. So these are some of the examples of the corridor studies that we've conducted. Uh, they can be region-wide, uh, like the Burlington to Williston US-2 study, or they could be more localized, like the Colchester Avenue study in Burlington, or the Route 116 study in Hinesburg. So all these, these studies uh, took into consideration the need to balance moving people and goods through these regional commuter routes with also the need to uh, support local livability. And one other thing to note is uh, each of these studies uh, sort of just use this comprehensive and, and multimodal approach to, to address the goals of the corridors. So scoping studies. So scoping studies uh, in, involve, it's, it's sort of a similar process but more focused uh, and it ends in the selection of a preferred alternative. And also uh, with scoping studies we have this what's called a purpose and need statement which essentially sets the stage uh, for the consideration of project alternatives. So the purpose is really used to define the, the transportation problem to be solved, while the need is, is essentially justifying what's driving the project. So prior to, to developing this, this purpose and need statement, we evaluate the existing and future conditions, and then we use that statement to uh, develop and, and also uh, evaluate the project alternatives. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you do a scoping study, where does the legislative body of the community, where it's our, our municipal partner, come in? Mm -hmm. And what kind of latitude do they have to actually impact something? Or is this heavily driven by technical issues? And that if a community doesn't like the preferred alternative, does it have any recourse to move that? Or is it going to be something where if they request a scoping study, they could end up with an alternative that might be wholly unacceptable to the local legislative body, and they wouldn't want to be put in a position of having to accept something that would kill them within their own town. Okay. I, I would, I would, Go ahead. I would say that you know at our uh, alternatives meeting, it usually is in front of a select board or city council, and they're they're the ones selecting preferred alternative. They decide whether mm -hmm. they they want to accept the committee's recommendation or not. They ultimately decide if it moves forward. Except that uh, when a project is on a state highway, on a state system, mm -hmm. uh, a, a local, uh, you know, elected body basically decides on uh, what we call a locally preferred alternative. And then, you know, and then VTrans does have, uh, you know, basically the ability to go back and maybe has some different ideas, but they will come back to the community. Mm -hmm. And talk about it, and talk about why one you know alternative is better than the other alternative, and hopefully through that dialogue, you're going to get to a common, uh, you know, to an alternative that we all agree on. I admire your optimism. Well, we have to be optimistic, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, but that's pretty much when it's a state system. I think Beatrice does have the ability to do that. Oh, absolutely. So that I is understand. the needs to be clear. And I think just to reinforce that, you know, for those of you that haven't maybe gone through that in much detail, like it really works when everybody's at the table through the entire process. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't work, it's because one or more parties wasn't at the table through the entire process and wasn't on the same page. And then we get into those situations that are, there's a disconnect and, you and know. It doesn't that, happen that often that we don't agree. Yeah. In my 12 years doing this, I think it's happened twice in probably dozens of studies. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention is, you know, we're always trying to uh, uh, provide as many opportunities as possible for public input in, in these sort of scoping studies and also corridor studies. 
So these are a few examples of the scoping studies that we've conducted. Uh, they all typically focus on addressing a specific aspect uh, related to the transportation system. So for example, the Winooski River Bridge study took a look at alternatives for a new bridge over the Winooski River. Uh, the Colchester Riverside Barrett study uh, took a look at uh, new alternatives for an uh, intersection in Burlington. And our Shelburne Gateway study uh, really focused on bicyclists and pedestrian improvements at the southern end of US 7 uh, in Shelburne. And it's, after we had these studies completed, we, we strive to work with VTRANS and the municipalities to get the uh, improvements in our TIP and the capital program for eventual implementation. Um, and the next level of uh, uh, CCRPC work is a technical assistance, so we provide technical assistance to municipalities. These are more like a local, uh, localized work uh, for municipalities. Um, as, Ma as Marshall mentioned, most of these requests comes through UPWP, but we also make uh, efforts to accommodate if there are any requests comes through uh, during the fiscal year. So most of the work, uh, we, we, uh, we assist uh, municipalities with the speed studies like setting speed limits on uh, local highways. Uh, recently we finished uh, speed studies uh, in Underhill, uh, Huntington, and Williston. Um, and then we also um, uh, do traffic calming studies for uh, uh, local neighborhoods. Uh, recently we finished a couple of uh, traffic calming studies in Williston, uh, like Blair Park uh, neighborhood and uh, Chamberlain and uh, uh, Brennan Woods neighborhood. So we come up with, we develop some recommendations for the town, what kind of traffic measure, traffic calming measures can be implemented in those neighborhoods. And also we also look into, we also work with uh, VTRANS and uh, evaluate uh, uh, crashes on uh, local highways. So we look at safety and also some side distance uh, issues at uh, critical intersections. If, uh, if, uh, if a town thinks that some of those intersections have inadequate side distance, then we can go out and uh, measure uh, what are the existing side distances at those intersections and <coughs> come up with recommendations. And again, we, can, uh, we also assist uh, towns in developing new signal timing plans for uh, signalized intersections that they own uh, because most of you know mo uh, mo most of the signal equipment are outdated and most of them are not up to the current standards. So <coughs> we are getting requests from municipalities to look at those uh, signals and then come up with a plan how to update those signals. Um, we also work with uh, VTRANS on other programs. So one of them is the road safety audits, where VTRANS identifies um, like a high crash locations. It could be a road segment, a road segment, maybe a mile or two mile, three mile road segment, or a, an intersection uh, where it's uh, identified as a high crash location. So we look at the crash types and crash data, and then VTRANS will develop an implementation plan for improvements. Um, and similar program is a systemic local safety program. Um, so we work with the municipalities and then they identify some uh, road segments which are which could be uh, high risk roads, not necessarily high crash locations, but they could be high risky roads for accidents, or sorry, crashes. Um, so we trans to develop a similar plan for uh, uh, improvements and then we provide those recommendations to the town and then it's 100% funded by VTRANS for installing the uh, improvements. And the next uh, component of transportation is uh, using technology. As you know, technology is getting, um, is growing exponentially now. So how can we use technology in transportation and make things uh, effectively, uh, efficiently, and moving things <coughs> and people efficiently in our, in our transportation system? That's the intelligent transportation system. Uh, in 2014, we updated our regional ITS plan and uh, developed a uh, strategic plan which identifies short-term, medium-term, and long-term projects. One of the projects is the advanced traffic monitoring system using Bluetooth technology. So we got uh, about a million dollars federal highway grants uh, for this project, and uh, we are in the final stage of completing this project. Uh, we installed like 33 Bluetooth sensors along five major corridors in the region. These Bluetooth sensors collect real-time travel data, and that travel data is, is useful for scoping studies and uh, mm, 
other uh, planning efforts and modeling uh, projects. So there are various applications that the real-time data can be used. And the next thing is we also <coughs> uh, work with municipalities to look at their signal system again from hardware and equipment point of view, like you know, to assess their um, conditions and then uh, develop a plan to how to upgrade those signals, uh, uh, signal heads, controller, any detection system, communication systems. So recently we finished uh, Exit 14 signal system uh, assessment study in South Burlington, which included signals along Dorset Street and Williston Street, Williston Road, sorry. <coughs> um, and also we done a uh, similar study for uh, Route 15 um, and uh, we also finished a recent study on uh, Shelburne Street in Burlington, where we identified some uh, deficiencies in the signal controllers, and we uh, developed a signal timing plan, as well as uh, equipment upgrade plan. And the next thing is uh, we also um, assisting municipalities to manage their local projects. So most of these local projects are funded by WeTrans. Uh, we are playing a <coughs> uh, manager role in managing those local projects. Um, uh, so we, we, we manage and assist uh, through the project development uh, stage and design. We also help municipalities in uh, um, getting their right of way or easements, um, and also do some construction uh, inspection. <coughs> so recently we finished a couple of sidewalk projects, one in Shelburne and another one in South Burlington. And currently we are working with Underhill uh, and also in Heinsberg for their side of projects. So these are all uh, locally managed raw projects. Any questions? Next slide. As you can see, much of what we do talks about infrastructure, right? We're trying to address some of the capacity issues, some of the infrastructure issues. Uh, but let's not forget about the people, right? We each make choices that impact how our system is functioning. And there's a, a technique or a program called transportation demand management, which tries to address those choices that we make on a daily basis on how we get around. Um, these can include incentives, uh, they can include disincentives, they can include policies such as flex time. You can show up to work a little earlier or later, you can leave work a little earlier or later. Perhaps you can walk or bike. Maybe there's uh, some sort of incentive program through a TMA, such as the Chittenden area TMA, if you walk or bike certain number of times, here's a little award for you, uh, a little incentive for you to go spend somewhere at a local store. Um, and part of what we do um, to achieve those goals and the vision in the ECOS plan, um, and TDM is called out as a way to accomplish those future goals that we have, is to work with our local partners, including the Chittenden Area TMA, Car Share Vermont, Green Mountain Transit, Local Motion, and most recently Green Ride Bike Share. Those organizations are providing programs and services that, as an organization, we don't provide, uh, but they're <coughs> eligible to apply for UP, WP funding to help uh, promote what they do to help us address not only the infrastructure stuff, right? We can, we can make new bridges and widen lanes if needed, <coughs> but if we can get people to change their behavior, that has a better, uh, more cost-effective impact on our transportation network than just building more things. Um, we have good, the Go Chittenden County logo up there. Uh, that was a, a brand we created a number of years ago uh, using a federal grant, uh, which really brought the partners, I don't want to say under an umbrella, but brought us all to the same table so that we can work uh, more coordinated together uh, on achieving those goals. So uh, at the time, CATMA was the campus area TMA. One of the projects through uh, Go Chittenden County grant was it expanded their services beyond the Hill institutions, off the campus area, and into the county. So we didn't need the Go Chittenden County brand anymore because Catmon was doing that sort of work. So the, the partners are rolling on with the great, great things they do. <coughs> Catmon has expanded their services um, to the employers in the region. Another uh, part that we do is people who choose to walk and bike. Uh, we have a pedestrian and bicycle program here. Uh, every five years, give or take, we revise our regional walk-bike plan. Most recently, we changed the name to that to the Regional Active Transportation Plan, because that's really what it is. It's an active transportation, it's an active mode. Um, that was adopted by you all, uh, the board, in 2017. Uh, 
through that program, we can also help your municipality develop your own local walk bike plan. We've done that with Essex and Essex Junction. We've done that with Jericho. We've assisted Burlington with theirs. And all the while, we're trying to align what the local, local folks are doing with our regional vision. So again, the active transportation plan is the regional vision. We're not looking at where sidewalks might need to go in your town, but it's looking at the connectivity at that higher level. And then at the local level, we can help you figure out what the priorities are. Uh, we can help with sidewalk and path planning. As I mentioned, those you know the, the grant programs that we can help manage. Uh, we can help you apply for grants. Uh, we just got work with St. George to get their little sidewalk to get some connections across Route 2A there, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so reach out to us. That's what we're here for to help you find money to do those things, the like construction projects. Local Motion has a number of projects to help us achieve uh, the goals that we want to accomplish in our uh, walking and biking program. Um, and again, I mentioned Green Ride Bike Share, which if you stay tuned for the board meeting after this, um, Bob, the general manager, and I will co-present um, to describe more about that effort. So data collection is a uh, large part of, of what we do here at the RPC um, and really lays the foundation for successful planning at all scales that, that we, Marshall, has, has really talked about. Uh, a big part of that, obviously, is transportation planning. So uh, turning movement counts and automated traffic recorders are, are a large part of our summer internship program. Um, we, we hire about six college interns every year to work for us, and um, they, do a, they do a great job. It's a learning experience for them, and they provide uh, a, a lot of valuable data that, that really drives the decision making uh, for us in, in various studies. Um, we're also helping out individual towns uh, better understand uh, the location and quality of their municipal assets. This is everything from pavement condition to locations and MUTCD compliance of signs. Um, we work with individual municipalities to kind of get a good understanding of a game plan as to exactly what we want to uh, sort of look at and, and what the data would be used for and then we'll sort of carry out that uh, inventory process throughout the course of a summer. Uh, uh, additionally, uh, a big part of our summer data collection plan is efforts in uh, helping municipalities in Chittenden County achieve the goals of the new municipal roads general permit. Uh, the, really the first step in this greater process is to complete the inventory of these roadways that do fall under this permit. Uh, we as staff here are also contributing to sort of the data management, reporting, and scoring of these individual roadway segments. <clears throat> but addition to, in addition to that, uh, the RPC is uh, conducting scoping studies and concept plans for locations that have sort of risen to the top as sort of highest contributors or potential highest contributors to water quality. Uh, we then sort of take those products and uh, assist towns in uh, applying for grants for uh, physical construction implementation of uh, sort of best practices. Uh, and then we kind of come full circle to reevaluate re things. Uh, this process has, you know, changed over the last couple of years and will continue to change, but it's very much a, a constant cycle of, of working through these, you know, this permit and individual towns assets within it. Um, and uh, we're, we're at a year uh, two out of a 20 year permit. So we have a lot more work to do coming up. Oh, sorry, can you hit forward? I'm, I'm good, thank you. So um, that was a very high level, very high level overview of what the work we do here. The UPWP is right here. If you go through it, it has really numerous projects. If you have any question about any of these projects, or reach out to us, we'd be happy to discuss. So now we're shifting gears a little bit to address some uh, common and questions that we got uh, the last session is how do transportation projects become projects and move through the process. So we're going <clears> to <throat> try to address it as a complex uh, issue, but we're going to try to just uh, simplify it a little bit. So for before you. we move on, yeah, can absolutely. I ask a question about yes. the last module? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I always kind of wonder if there isn't more we as people who are representatives who are also MPO board members could do in terms of facilitating communication between the community mm -hmm. staff and our MPO staff. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, and you know, is it 
too much to ask of an MPO board rep to be up to speed on all the scoping studies that are going on in their community. Or if there's a corridor study or something like that, that the MPO board member on this board should be at least in the email loop. Mm -hmm. um, and as an MPO board rep and RPC commissioner, when Charlie goes, or if Christine goes, or if someone's going to my legislative body, mm -hmm. um, I think, and you know, my fellow board members can tell me I'm full of crap, which I am, but maybe not on this. Um, maybe we should be more actively involved in those communications as facilitators because most of us have good relationships with our boards and with our public works departments if our community has a public works department. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get surprised. I didn't know Christine was going to my board, you know, two weeks ago or something like that. Whereas if I'm there because of our relationship as a conduit to the community, we could maybe help facilitate this process a little. And maybe I think, maybe I'm expecting too much from people who sit at this board, but you know, maybe we should be more, we should know when a staff member or when Charlie or sure. when you are going to the board in enough time so that it's not like two days before you do it so we don't have enough time to get prepared. Right. To be, to, if, and if, you know, at, at least I would like to be able to call Charlie to say, ask Christine or ask Eleni, do they need help? How's it going on this project? Is there something that isn't hitting home or is there some disagreement about what the best alternative is on a mm -hmm. scoping study? And, you know, is it on a state road or is it on a, you know, a town road and how much flexibility and latitude do we have? Mm -hmm. Is there something that the board member can do to talk to maybe the chair of the legislative body or a particular member of the legislative body that's got some concerns? <laughs> and we could try to help explain it or at least to facilitate a communication yeah. on that so it's more efficient not only for our MPO RPC staff but it's also more efficient on the town staff which five times out of ten unless you've got a public works you know director or something like that you know these folks are trying to be chief cook and bottle washer on a million things right. um, so are we missing an opportunity are we doing enough and if we are doing enough tell me and I'll shut up I I'd be interested to hear from other yeah. board members about yeah because I, I think it's a good question because I think probably staff maybe feels like we're protecting the board members from getting sucked into conversations you may not want to be involved in but at the other hand maybe maybe we're doing you a disservice by not <coughs> having you in the communication or maybe group. you're doing yourselves a disservice by yeah well yeah having or, us in or the whole effort yeah. yeah. Because so, we, we, I mean, everybody here has a relationship with yeah. the board because we get appointed by our or, boards for going out loud. Or on the select board. <laughs> so, uh, thoughts uh -huh. or? I mean, for myself, when when Charlie or someone goes to the city council meetings, I like to know, and I often will go with you. Yeah. Um, on the other ones, for our commissions, to the you know, for public works or something. Um, it might be nice to know, but I'm probably not going to show up at very many mm -hmm. of those. Just it gives you the option. If you can be helpful, you, you would, might go if you would be helpful. But I, but I often see what different projects are going on. So, um, so it might be helpful to at least get the notices of them. Um, but again, I'm less likely to go to those. But to the council meetings, I typically go to those. And, I think it, I think, and, and that, I do think, is really helpful to go to. I agree with that. How many people go with you when you show up or when you show up to talk about something or when you show up or when you guys show up or when you show up? Uh, how, how, is it rare that a board member goes with you to those meetings? Or? Uh, so, I mean, there's different levels of things that we <laughs> yeah. go to the councils for or the select board for. Like, so when I go to the select board for like annual report, you know, I copy you, every, you, know, you all every time. And some of you are on the board, so you're there already. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah, that is easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and other times, you know, uh, the board, CCRPC board members that are not on the city council or select board will accompany me usually if they're, if they're able to. So that works. But 
at a project for projects level. We don't, we don't usually yeah. mm -hmm. inform it. We could. We could add you to the distribution list, and you can have that information, and you can decide if you want to just come or not. Well, I mean, we would have the option then, yeah. and we, we, we could investigate whether we would be helpful. Right. Yeah, so if we both are, if we are with a consultant with going to the select board or, or city council, well, at least CCing you on that communication, mm -hmm. like, right. yeah, let's try to do that. You know, so, I'm struck that there may be things that are sort of above the waterline or below the waterline. So the projects and scoping study have a certain profile. But then there's the other question of like the technical assistance activities. Yes. And, right. You know, so I guess the question is where that belongs. And some things, when they start, you don't know how big it's going to get. And it might be worthwhile being in the loop for those because you might have an opinion as a board member who's not on the select board or city council. Because some things start off as a conversation, right? And it's not a, an official agenda item at the local governing body. I mean, I don't know about other board members, but every once in a while I get surprised because town or village staff will write an email about something that they had an interaction with the staff. And, um, an and, and so I, I think we should at least be kept appraised of that because sometimes we can sometimes help assuage the concerns of a staff member or a or a town or village administrator or, or, or manager or something mm -hmm. like that um, if for no other reason is just making that <coughs> staff member believe that their concerns were heard by the right person who needed to hear them yeah. we will try to do better at that I think it's a good it's a good question now you know at one level I guess you know be careful what you ask for let us know if it is too. There's too much above the waterline, um, you know. And well, we can make yeah. a decision. And if, right. it's, if it's gray, all we got to do is bother you, right? Exactly. And yeah. We all got your cell phone number. <laughs> so yeah. send me an email. Yeah. Yep. Um, and and but, I think it's important, but, just like with, yep. if you don't mind me interjecting, just like with our um, our town um, staffs. Uh, I think it's a good rule that, you know, usually when we talk to our town staffs, we go to the administrator or the manager or the chair of the board, okay? I think if before you would call Laney or Christine or anybody else on RPC, MPO staff, I think it's important that we touch base with Charlie because no, I mean, Charlie may have a perspective if, or if view on the issue. information. Yeah. <laughs> if you just want to say something nice to them, feel free. <laughs> well, on something substantive, I think you yeah, need yeah. to know. Yeah, fair. And it's not fair to the staff member because they may not have all the information that's needed to be conveyed to you. Yeah. No, that's good. So we'll let uh, Eleni get into the the more meaty Pete here. Yeah, that was my soapbox. No, that was good. No, that's absolutely that's good. good. That's, that's good helpful suggestion. to us. I'm going to try and, and include you. Uh, so shifting a little gears. But I reserve the right to call Amy anytime I want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you never have. I know. Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> OK, on that note, we, let's move I, forward. There will be no opportunity here. <laughs> so uh, the question was, how does a transportation project becomes a project and you know the answer is kind of through various different ways like one way is like you know is there a community need and that can be anything uh, you know starting is there an issue with safety uh, at an intersection or you know at the two-lane rural highway or anything is there any issue with the capacity you have plenty of delays on an intersection the signal is not working very well again that can become it, this is the impetus of just starting a project. And then uh, also any, anything else like access to jobs. How do we improve access <coughs> to jobs or support housing? And that's the community need. A lot of the projects also come, and, and Marshall talked about corridor management studies that we do. A lot of those projects come through that process is when we look at the specific corridor or an area. We basically evaluate issues, we develop alternatives and recommendations. And some of these recommendations from corridor studies can move forward into implementation without further evaluation. And that's the operational uh, recommendations and strategies and some other ones. But some of them, they need more focused study. And that's what we do in scoping or project definition as we call it now. So scoping and project definition is the very beginning of the project development process. 
And uh, I put a flow chart here, which is very, very simple. Nothing is simple in, in real life. Uh, it's uh, usually a very messy process, but this is just basically to indicate the major steps in the project development process. So first, you identify a project. You get authorization to proceed, and that happens whether there is a big veterans project or a smaller uh, municipal project. And then you start your project development process. If you are using federal funding, as most of the trans projects do, then you need to go through, through a, you know, a, a scoping, which is something that we do here for Chinon County. And scoping, again, Marshall talked about it. You uh, look at issues, you develop alternatives, you develop a purpose and need, and then at the very end, you have a locally preferred alternative. Uh, and that becomes the alternative that you move forward into conceptual plans. Once you do that, then you start going through your environmental permit. The environmental permit is the next step. And again, nothing is so clear cut, but that's pretty much approximately how it is. And Amy, right. jump in anytime you want to. And then you moved into the environmental permitting, which is basically <coughs> under, uh, you know, uh, you know, you go through what we call NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, and once you start doing that, and then, you know, as you go through NEPA and you start your preliminary designs, uh, then you have this other process on the right that I have uh, called Town and Act of 50 Permits. And that's a, a parallel but very important process that every project, depending on the complexity and the size, needs to do to get all the permits so they can move forward to uh, final design, well, the right of, uh, right of way acquisition, I'm sorry, I, I, I gloss over that. But any project that uses federal funding has to go a very prescribed process. And it's a very involved and lengthy process sometimes, again, depending on the complexity of the project. Uh, and then once all the permits are ready, you have all of them, you have your town, your Act of 50, you finish with all the litigation, <laughs> Sometimes, uh, and uh, then you move towards final design, and uh, you go for contract bid plans. And if everything goes well, you go to construction. So this is a very, very simplified process. I'm going to stop right there and uh, you know ask if you have any questions. This is the VTrans process. The municipal process might be a little simpler than this. But this is the process that you go if you're using federal funds in any project. You might comment on the length of time from the first step to the last. <laughs> I, I was I was very reluctant to do that. In years, this would be fine. Uh, we have some examples. These look like little buttons that you just click, click, yeah, click, know, click. What could go wrong? Uh, we have some examples that is going to show you uh, yeah, approximately the, the length of process, uh, you know, that this process is going to take for some projects. Yeah, we got a few minutes. Why don't you get it, like, kind of show them a couple? Yeah. Uh, okay, so Jason is going to go through uh, the most mm. complex of the projects. So our first example is Exit 16, which... Uh, oh, this is a typical one. Yeah. That is a typical yeah. one, isn't it? Uh, Great. Many of you might be aware of it's uh, been in the news quite, quite a bit um, due to its ongoing uh, legal disagreements. But we started a circulation study back in 2009, and this was a study that really looked at the area in terms of its uh, land use growth potential and what those impacts would be to the surrounding system and looked at alternatives. And the study was finalized and then we went right into a scoping study that focused on the interchange and really the surrounding area of the corridor of uh, routes <coughs> two and seven that passed through there. And once that was finalized and a municipal preferred alternative was selected, which was a diverging diamond interchange, we have a couple of photos so you can hold questions on what exactly that is for right now. Um, it then entered into the VTRANS um, uh, project development process and they've achieved a couple of milestones that you see listed there. Uh, I, I mentioned they do have their ongoing uh, legal issues there. And uh, as of right now, they have construction scheduled for 2020 and 2021. And I would just 
offer a word of caution that's maybe a bit of a moving target uh, depending on how things go in the courtroom. How have the lawyers done on that, Mr. Chair? <laughs> So from initial start to potential construction, over 10 years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a nice colorful rendering uh, of, of what it might look like. <laughs> there it is, it's completed. Uh, special thanks to That's V-Trans and Stantec. Clip this Beautiful. right from the V-Trans website. Yeah, moving forward to 2025. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not familiar with how this would work, you would do <laughs> Traveling through the interchange, you would actually cross over to the other side of the road um, between the bridges, and then you would cross back over. And it's a very efficient way to move vehicles through an interchange. And uh, I forgot to mention, but the bridges that go over routes two and seven there are in very good condition. So all the alternatives focused on ways of improving capacity and throughput through this area without having to touch the bridges. Are those yield signs there or are those stop signs? There's where the traffic crosses over. Where the traffic crosses. Like here stop signs. It's a signal. That's oh, a signal. it's a signal? That's a signal? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Signal. Oh, I didn't understand that before. Yeah. See, so if you're traveling northbound, you go north, you would stop here if you have a red light. If not, you just proceed through. Oh, okay. Oh, the, the, yeah. the bar goes yeah. across the shadow. That's why yeah. it was hard to see. Yeah. Okay. And then everything else coming off the off-ramps, well, this one's signalized, but uh, if you're, the other ones are yield controlled right here. And then here's a... And the pedestrians uh, have to cross up the... The pedestrians go linear, linearly along um, the outsides of the street. So if you're a pedestrian, you follow this, you cross, cross again, and then the paths would go behind the piers on the bridge, and then they would continue up that way. There's no way to actually cross routes two and seven in that vicinity. And I get to finish up with something that is finished, yay. Um, so this is a culvert project that we did. This one was also about 10 years from scoping to completion. 116 culvert. Um, it's between Hinesburg Road and um, Williston Road. It's between Kennedy Drive, sorry, Kennedy Drive and Williston Road in South Burlington. Um, we did the scoping, CCRPC did the scoping in 2007. We went through the full process that Marshall and Eleni were talking about before purpose and need, we did a, a full assessment of the conditions. So this is a map of where it's located. Um, there's a little yellow circle, I don't know if I have a pointer here, that shows where the culvert actually is. Um, what was interesting for this is that um, CCRPC did the scoping of this, and we were also involved in a traffic analysis that looked at the impacts of closing the road, so it was determined in the scoping that Maintaining two lanes was not possible. The alternatives looked at closing the road completely and maintaining one lane. So it was decided to do a full closure. The road was closed for two months for those who have um, been, been through it, had to go around it during the time. Um, but it was constructed in 2017. I got a couple of pictures here. This top picture is the before condition. Um, it was um, it's an interesting, I don't, I don't know if other people find this interesting, but it was actually um, two pieces, on e it, the, the culvert was in three pieces with a box culvert on one side, a metal culvert on the other side, and just, <coughs> it, the water just passed through a rock cavern in the middle. And no one quite knew what was going on there. Um, they couldn't really get cameras down there to look at it. It was partially blocked, a lot of water quality issues but this bottom one is a beautiful culvert that was completed. Um, and interesting too, there was a pedestrian bridge that was put in during the construction so that, con so that pedestrians could continue to cross even though cars could not. Um, and then the last one we're gonna talk about is also a completed project. It's a sidewalk on 116. It connected Tilly Drive to an existing sidewalk. This is a study where CCRPC helped the town do an application for a bike ped grant 
Brian was talking about that before. So we were involved in this grant project process. We were also municipal project manager. Both Brian and Cy worked on this project. Beautiful job completing the sidewalk connection. It meanders through. It's kind of wet in there. Very nice walk. So that was about seven years for that sidewalk, for the timing. I think that's it, right? Yeah. So that's, that's it. So if you have any questions, please <laughs> reach out to us. <coughs> so, Mr. Executive Director and Chair, is this our last yes. MPO training session? Yes. That's what we would you, you like more? Would you like more? And <laughs> what, what, what's no, I'm just, I'm what just asking if we completed the program that the yeah, Public yeah. Development yeah. Committee suggested that we do. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and I, I guess. I would have if anybody that. has suggestions about how mm -hmm. helpful this was right. or yeah, feedback would be well. not helpful it was <laughs> to the people who came, yeah. you know, we have a lot of new board members. And so the board development committee, which is chaired by Andy Montrell, we kind of all thought that we needed to do this because MPO is a lot of alphabet soup to particularly to new board members. And it's sometimes a good refresher for existing board members. Um, and as long as we keep having turnover, it's almost like we should repeat this every year. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and every year, or every two or three years. Uh, if, if we have keep having turnover, because yeah. every single I time mean, we go through it, I pick up something new, and I've been on this board since 2001. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I'm a new person, and unfortunately, I couldn't make it to the previous mm. two. I just had. You miss good food too. I, we had steak at one of those. <laughs> um, Lobster at the other. I, you know, I, I feel like it's I'll a steep learning curve, yeah. so whatever else you want to do, I'm, if I could make it to them, I would, I would try. Is there a better time to have them than no, before the board meeting? No, it's a hard, you know, it's just, it was just conflicts I had. Yep. I mean, speaking for myself, you can never find a time that's good for everybody, so why? Well. And I, sh I sh okay, I should do that. I will do that. I promise. That's a good point. Well, if you have a question, reach out to any of us, or we love to answer questions. Okay. <laughs> we love to talk about our work. <laughs> it's all good, important work. I, I find the training uh, useful. I, I did find some of these kind of graphic representations particularly interesting because I could wrap my mind around these so um, my, my sense is that towns operate uh, a little differently from each other and their relationship to the RPC probably changes a little bit town to town that's my sense I mean I'm just sort of feeling the elephant I not really positive but that's my sense um, and so what might uh, require to Jeff's point uh, you know, if you're on the select board and you're sitting at this table, that's a different thing than perhaps if you're a bigger town and there's a different kind of, or a smaller town, I don't know, uh, and then you have a representative. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of that's really hard to wrap your mind around, but I, I did find it real useful. And I, I, I liked the fact that m the regular rep, uh, Catherine, pressed me into a commitment for the three meetings because <laughs> she said this is the way you got to do it, Wayne, and and I, I think that was really useful to know in that I had to I had to do this three times. So thank you. All right, we will call the full commission meeting to order for November twenty eighth, two thousand eighteen. Yes. Bernie would like to take minutes. There's the minute taker wants your minor detail. Okay. Sorry. So you're going to start over with that. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll start with uh, any changes to the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing the consent agenda. Well, we we well, we're not there yet. Um, next item is um, that we provide an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment on any items that do not appear on the agenda. Is there anybody here who wishes us to make um, such a comment? Hearing none. Now I move the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Is there anybody who wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? 
The ayes have it. Next item is approval of the minutes of our October 17, 2018 meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Are there any comments, changes? Catherine isn't here, so probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'm going to tell you you said that. <laughs> she knows. She knows. She knows. <laughs> Hearing. Because usually my motion includes with Catherine's changes. Hearing nothing, all in favor of the motion to approve say aye. 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 I'll abstain, Bernie. I, I, oh, we haven't even gotten there yet. Any opposed? <laughs> Everyone wants to move along quickly this <laughs> evening. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. Mr. Chair, I forgot to say something at being in the meeting. I'm also representing the junction tonight. Okay. So I forgot to mention that. I apologize. Are there any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. So Bernie, uh, Dave Tilton, and John Zaccone. Anybody else have seen it? And Jackie. Yeah. Next item uh, on our agenda is a presentation by Fred Duplessis of Sullivan Powers regarding our fiscal year 18 audit. So I'd like to welcome Fred Back again to the commission. It's not here. It's a, no, we'll, I'll sit here and be sharing. You don't have to be sharing. I can be here. <laughs> All right, so um, i give you a quick overview and then see if there's any questions. Um, I see the bound reports, and I think you've had PDFs um, copies for a little bit. So this, this is a multi-part audit. Um, it's an audit of the financial statements in accordance with uh, generally accepted auditing standards. It's also in accordance with government auditing standards, which are a little more stringent, uh, requires a letter and review of the compliance with laws and regulations and internal control at the uh, financial statement le uh, level. And because you expended over $750,000 of federal funds, it's also a single audit in accordance with now called the Uniform Guidance, which is a consolidation of all of the various regulations into, into one document. So it, it really is a multi-part document. Um, it will get submitted electronically to the federal government. It will be available on the Clearinghouse website. Uh, it becomes a public document at that point in time. Um, and so the, from our perspective, um, our role is to provide the reports. Uh, the first report is on the financial statements, and that indicates that your financials are in full conformance with generally accepted accounting principles. So that's a clean, unmodified opinion. There's been no changes in the standards this year that affected the Planning Commission. Nothing I see going forward that will affect the Planning Commission. Big changes coming up in a number of years. They want to revise all of the standards and the methods of looking at things but that's a ways away. So um, the, I, I'm sure you're familiar with most of the, uh, the numbers, um, so I'm not going to go into that. What I read and is management's discussion and analysis, and that starts on page four and runs for five or six pages. Anyone who wants to get a good sense of what happened during the year can get it just in reading that. Uh, as it's indicated, it's written by management. We, we have to ensure that all the information there is consistent with what's in the audit that follows uh, and that it includes all of the required information and it does. So you get a really good sense of what happened. Uh, there's some summary financial information. There's some narrative that talks about what happened. There's a little bit of information about what's going forward. So you can get quite a bit of information in just those six pages. The, the key page is the very last page, and this is what the state and the federal government will turn to when they get this report. And it's the summary. And what that indicates, as I indicated, is that the auditor's report's unmodified. We had no findings. Uh, we had no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control or no noncompliance findings related to the financial statements. And in our audit of the Highway Planning and Construction Funds, which was the major program this year. Um, some of that is based on dollars spent. Some of it's a rotation of large programs. And this is the program we tested this year. We had no, again, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, and our report on compliance was un unmodified, which means that in all of the various testing that we did, we had no findings. 
Um, and what all of that means is that the very last line is that because you've done this now for at least three years in a row, you qualified to be what's considered a low risk oddity. Um, and what that means is that not only do you have the systems in place to manage uh, federal funds, but you've proved you can do it over a long period of time. And so that's an important distinction. Um, it, it indicates to the, to the feds and to the state that you do have good systems in place um, and that, that they're functioning the way they're supposed to be. So um, it's nice to see that. That is something they look at and take seriously. I don't know if there's any general questions or any specific questions on any of the numbers of the reports that I can answer. Um, pension liabilities on yep. age five. Yep. We are a taker of the actuarial assumptions from the VMERS, V-M-E-R-S, which is the acronym for the Municipal, Municipal Employees yep. Retirement System. Correct. Um, recently, Moody's Investor Service downgraded the state. <coughs> They did. Um, from AAA to AA plus. And that'll affect and I was some of our towns. So I was wondering how much <clears throat> that might affect the actuarial assumptions, and should we be looking at what that might do to the pension liability note we have to supply in our, to our community? Remember yeah, the it, it should have no impact on the assumptions themselves. Uh, the, the reduction rating was due to the, the assumptions that were in place. Uh, partly from Beamers, mostly from state teachers and state pension, but all part of it. And so what, what the bond market is starting to look at is understanding that Vermont has severely underfunded their punch pensions. Um, the Beamers is the highest funded. It, it, it has the highest ratio, and it's, it's hovered somewhere uh, between 90 percent. Um, it, was, it was down to... Um, I think 83 and a half percent last year. So it, it was as high as 98 percent in 2015. And so it's going to there's going to be fluctuations. Some of it's due to assumptions. Some of it's due to changes in mortality rates. Um, but but over time it has been dipping a little bit. <laughs> so the answer is is that this will have an impact on already has on the bond rating because most of you borrow through the bond bank and their credit is based on the state's credit, we expect to see some, some increase in borrowing costs as a result of the state not funding the pension. Uh, this one is funded because they get the money from you. Any money that goes into this pension is from the municipalities and the various districts. The teachers, obviously, and the state is funded by the state, and that one has not been funded, although the governor has indicated that he's going to use this year's surplus to put more money into it. It will be a drop in a bucket. Uh, and for this year, there's also a huge liability that hasn't been discussed for post-employment benefits, health insurance. Uh, that's even bigger than the, than the uh, pension liability. So my takeaway, if you don't mind me if just following Take up, it. Yep. is um, that the chances that we as an organization will have what I call a UFO, which is an unrecognized financial obligation, from that is small. Is small, correct. And based on everything that the actuaries have told us over in consistently is that at the current funding levels with minor increases, eighth of a point here and there over the next number of years, that there will be plenty of money in the Beamers Fund to pay all liabilities for all retirees for as long as we can see. And so this is one of the better funded. And it, it has a minor impact on that rating, but it's more the state pension itself and particularly the teachers. So, but, but it, it shouldn't affect the, the, uh, the assumptions. And just, uh, if you want to see more detail on that, page 20 of the audit has more detail. It actually has like the percent that is, uh, is that it's funded at 83.64%. Yep. Yep. One big thing, just because there are these three big pension plans, right? the municipal, the state employees, and the teachers, um, and um, made reference to the health insurance. The Veemers does not have health insurance Correct. for retirees. I just want to make sure people are clear on that. I, th I, to my I think that's only the teachers' yep. pension fund that has uh, health retirement benefits. So. And the state that's, probably as well. Oh, the state does too? Sorry. I believe so, yeah. Uh, but no, any health insurance would be things that you've promised. Hired before a certain point in time, right? It stopped. I don't know. 
I think no, it, they just altered it. It depends. They on altered how many it. Years. Okay. You have to have years of service. Used to be five years. You'd get eighty percent. Then they. I thought like in they stretched it out to you get a lifetime get benefit for eight, health. You did get you know, five years. You're in, but then you only get ten, uh, twenty percent, and then another ten years you get another twenty percent, and five years you get another. So okay. it, it escalates. I didn't mean to get into that, but I just was concerned about an unrecognized financial opportunity. No, it, that would already have to be recognized if you had it, and you don't, so it's not in here. Uh, there are a few municipalities that do, but that's rare. Are there any other issues that could result in UFOs for us? That you see? No, I don't. I don't see anything. In fact, you know, I I don't frankly think that the Beamer should be on your books at all either, because it's something you have no control over. You're paying what you're supposed to pay. It's funded. It's supposed to be, but but yet it it had an impact this year of reducing your total equity by about two hundred sixty-seven thousand, and so it, it's a liability that shows up on your books, but you can't change it. Uh, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But they can come back to us if it turns out to be underfunded and assess us proportionally. Correct. So that's why it has to be on our books. It's there to show that, that you do, you are ultimately responsible for the money. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a little more nuanced in, in our situation because uh, as an employer, we're over contributing. And so we've kind of made a deal with our staff, including myself, that any additional contributions will be picked up by the employee. So. It's a, a little more nuanced for us in right. terms of, you know, uh, even less liability in terms of the organization and ultimately yep. to municipalities here. I know there's any other questions or issues? Well, I, uh, I've made this comment before, but I'd be remiss not to make it again. It's um, always an important accomplishment to come through the audit process as well as we do, and that doesn't happen by accident, of course, it's the hard work of staff, particularly Forrest and Bernie and all the staff and their work on the financial systems that do this. And I think that uh, they are to be commended on another year of a clean audit. And though it doesn't sound real sexy to be referred to as a, what was the, what's the, a low risk auditee, uh, I guess unless you're an accountant that maybe gives you a, a, a thrill, but, um, the reality is it that might be the auditors. <laughs> the uh, the uh, it, it's it's an it's an important accomplishment, which makes all of our work as commissioners a lot easier without having to worry about those things as well. Hey, Mr. Chair, yeah. I, I I always say it every year too. I want to echo that, but I also want to echo our vendor, mm -hmm. uh, echo compliments to our vendor, because we put this out to bid, mm -hmm. and we asked the vendor to rotate. Aud accountants and auditors to come through to make sure that everything was above board and um, Fred's accounting firm they've they've been extremely um, responsive to all the concerns that the members of the finance committee have had about making sure that you know we're doing everything with the people's money properly above board and transparently and so I I want to personally thank the our vendor on this we've had a long-term relationship with them and he willingly went through a full RFP process last time um, that we uh, that we retained his firm and he's been very responsive to all of our requests. Great. So at this time we need a motion to accept the I move that the uh, CCRPC board accept uh, the audit as uh, presented here this evening. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much, Fred. Good. Have Drive safe. Day. All right. Take care. Thank you, Fred. Next item on the agenda is a discussion regarding the Green Ride bike share update. Pause just a second. Is this going to be a PowerPoint? <laughs> are you going to make the, no, no the words are going to spin tonight. around? Yeah. No vacuums tonight. <laughs> Yeah. Props. <laughs> Props. Props. Maybe I maybe I spoke too soon. <laughs> you are going to tell us how many did. of those things yes. are in the lake, right? <laughs> yes. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to ride it? Everybody can ride it. That's a good lap. Like winter tires. All right. Mute. Snooze. Something. Uh oh, better oh, get Laney here. Describe mm -hmm. my weekend. Right. <laughs> Mute. Snooze. Snooze something. Eat. <laughs> so, 
kind of PowerPoint I like. Okay, um, during our board training, I mentioned Green Ride Bike Share a couple times, so now you get to hear a little bit more about it. Um, hopefully you've all seen the bikes in Burlington, South Burlington, Newski. Hopefully you've seen people riding them around. Um, instead of standing and talking in the back of Jeff's head, I'm going to move around a little bit and mix it up. See, I told you it wouldn't be boring. Um, so again, I'm Brian Davis. I'm one of the transportation planners here. I do a bunch of work related to transportation demand management and walking and biking. Um, this is Bob Dale. He's the general manager for Green Ride Bike Share. Um, Winooski resident. I'm going to put a plug in for that. Yeah. Uh, so we got a local guy here. Um, so let's just jump right in instead of me talking over myself. Um, bike sharing is uh, basically a fleet of bicycles that's available for the public to use. Right? You find a bike, you walk up to it, do whatever you need to do, hop on it, ride to where you want to go, drop off the bike, and you're done. Um, what makes it work is the number of bikes, the number of stations, or leaving it somewhere else. Uh, we're working on our next phase for that. Uh, and we're looking at all the benefits that Bike Share can provide. Uh, it helps people get around. It's an affordable for way to people get around. It's an affordable way for people to park right in front of a business, or shopping center, uh, address some of the congestion, congestion issues, air quality issues, health issues, you're getting physical exercise while you're going somewhere as well. Um, so it's great, and when we combine that with transit, with walking, uh, we're really expanding the ways that people can get around. Uh, you know, John mentioned how many are in the lake. Well, fortunately, that doesn't really happen with our system. Um, you know, bike sharing was started uh, in Amsterdam in the 60s. They had the free white bikes around, right? Just walk up to it, find it, junk it, trash it, steal it, whatever you want to do with it. Um, while you know many have deemed it as a failure, it really opened up the door for where we are today. Um, in the 90s, it was sort of a dumb dock situation. You could do these coin, you drop a coin in a slot. That's kind of like this old grocery cart, grocery cart systems. Put a coin in, it releases the bikes, you ride it. When you're done, you dock it back up, you get your coin back. You get a little, you get a little bit of skin in the game about a ton, but it's something. Moving on to the smart dock in the 2000s, I'm sure you've heard of Bixie and Delib in Paris. Again, you've got these, this, it's a, a dock heavy infrastructure, right? You've got these racks with the dock, with the bikes docked in there, some kiosk, you can use your credit card, big light up display, but the tech is all there. Once you give your information, pay your fee, take the bike out, it's, it's a bike. Um, it's heavy, it's clunky, it gets you around, and then you get where you need to be, and you gotta slam it back in the dock. Works, wildly successful. Set the stage for the next iteration of uh, bike sharing, which is the smart, smart bike. Social bicycles took the technology out of the docking station and put it on the back of the bike, which you can see there. So now we are able to use regular bicycle racks, inexpensive, and track all the bikes, where they go, um, and that provides us a lot of data. Uh, we know how far people are riding, how long they're on the bike, where they're going, um, how many times they use the system, how many calories they're burning, how many dollars they're saving, a lot of data. Um, the most current iteration of bike sharing is the dockless systems. And I'm sure you've heard of companies mostly coming out of China, but we also have some in the U.S. now where you don't need any racks or stations. There are just bikes everywhere, which is convenient in that you can use your phone and find a bike over there and get it and ride it and you're done. And Leave it on the sidewalk if you want, lock it over here if you want, put it in your front yard if you want. Uh, toss it in the lake if you want. Toss it in the lake if you want. <laughs> uh, they're also chipped so they can find them, but again, it's, you know, there's another way to do it which is a little more organized. Um, and I'm sure you've also heard about scooters. Well, peel your head there, scooter share pilot, which just concluded. So things are moving very, very, very quickly when we started our process. Um, with this bike, um, dockless wasn't even a thing. Um, that's how fast uh, things are happening. Scooters weren't a thing until this year. So it's really full steam ahead. Um, and it's not necessarily something new. It's been looked at here. It's identified in a bunch of local plans, including our own <coughs> active transportation plan that bike sharing is a way to achieve the goals in our regional plans and our transportation plans that we want to achieve. Uh, Burlington's uh, plan B to be walk bike mentions it, UVM in their active transportation plan, same thing with Champlain College. 
it's recognized as uh, a type of transportation option that we desire here. Um, you can see there I have a, a bullet with a, a feasibility study by local motion. Um, I'll get to that in a second. In CATMA, Chittenden Area TMA, you know, bike sharing is a way of helping them achieve the goal um, of expanding transportation options, uh, particularly for employers. A little bit of history about our current system that we have here. Uh, in 2011, there were a group of, group of folks, including myself, um, some city staff, local motion, um, a reporter, uh, some campus representatives. We went up to Montreal to meet with um, the, the company that uh, runs Bixie up there to meet with them and figure out how, how do you get this thing started? What does it look like? How does it function? What does it cost? So when it comes time to do it here, we have that. We came away thinking, wow, that is super duper expensive, crazy expensive, because all the tech is on the docks. It's very dock heavy, still very new. Uh, even in 2011, seven years, old, seven years old, right? But I showed you the timeline. It's changed three times since then. Um, in the meantime, uh, University of Vermont, Champlain College, and even the city of Burlington had their own bike library style system of bike sharing. So you have to have someone that staffs this, right? You walk up, you say, I'd like to borrow the bike. They hand you a key. You go unlock the lock with the key. You go ride your bike, and you got to bring it back there. And you have to hand your key in. So there's a little bit of uh, human touch necessary. There's a little bit of time limit. If someone's not staffing the table at that time, you don't get to ride the bike. Um, but it functions when it's open. Uh, but there is a desire with them and here at the Regional Planning Commission that uh, especially recognizing what's happening across the world and our country that this can work here. We're progressive enough. We know bike sharing will work here. So in October 2016, we put out an RFP uh, and selected Gotcha Bike as a preferred vendor. They are out of South Carolina. Um, so they build their own bikes and they use social bicycles technology. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of proud that we put the RFP out in October and not two years later we had bikes on the ground. And it was a lot of work. Uh, I will say that the RPC didn't write any checks. It's my staff time. It's part of what I do is my job. Um, and so who's involved? That's probably your next question, I would guess. Um, CAP is at the table, UVM, Champlain College, and us. That's our local bike share team. Uh, we're close partners with uh, Gotcha Bike, which is part of the Gotcha Group. Old Spokes Home holds the contract for balance, rebalancing the system. When all the bikes end up at the bottom of the hill, they're in charge of bringing them back up the hill. <laughs> Uh, and maintaining the bikes. They make sure that everything's working correctly. Users can report an issue. If something's wrong with the bike, the button's on the back, they can say flat tire, something's wrong, headlight doesn't work. It pings the back end and we can get that fixed right away. And the contract with Gotcha Bike is held by CATMA. And as you know, hopefully you know, CATMA is a nonprofit. So this isn't a money seeking business venture for us. This is a transportation option that we wanted to provide for the public. You can walk, you can have a private bike, you can use car sharing, we have a good bus system, and this fills that first mile, last mile connection. As stated in our mission, look at that, I got ahead of myself. Um, this is why we started it. We want to provide a transportation option for people to get around. An affordable, convenient transportation option for people to get around. And it would accomplish all of those things and more. And Gotcha Bike has been responsive to us. They typically have three speed bikes. When they brought their demo, we were like, no, there's a big hill, you need seven <laughs> speeds. And they were like, no problem, let's do it. So they put seven speeds on there. Um, I mentioned those at the beginning, I won't read bullets to you, because that's boring. And equity, not everyone has a smartphone, so how do we get around <coughs> that? Uh, people can go to the brick and mortar establishment, uh, at this point, it's Old Spokes Home. We're working on um, expanding our Green Ride for All program. <coughs> so you can go in, make a cash payment, and get your user information to enter on the pen on the back of the bike. The rate is also lower. Uh, so we want this, again, it's a transportation option for people, so we're trying to make it accessible. Sponsorship, we, we scraped and clawed uh, enough funding to get this on the ground. We have our title sponsors of Ben and Jerry's and Seventh <coughs> Generation. We're very grateful for their support. Um, other sponsors include University of Vermont Medical Center, uh, UVM, there's a student fund called the Clean Energy Fund. Uh, we applied for and were awarded a grant uh, through that program to help get bikes on the ground. Champlain College and UVM supplied this first round of the bike racks. 
which is fantastic. The, there's a safety sticker in the basket. Uh, some of you can see that. That's sponsored by Blue Cross Blue, Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, VTrans is participating through the Go Vermont program. AARP is on board. They see the value and how this can serve their population. Healthy Living is one of our private sponsors. They're like, yep, we want bikes in front of our store. People will use them. Um, and then uh, partnerships with the, the current cities. Our future vision is to expand it. Right now, uh, we are in these three towns. And then our partner team over there. And now I'll pass it on to Bob. Cool. I might just sneak up here real yeah, quick just to talk over the bike with you guys a little bit. So as Brian mentioned, these bikes are uh, assembled from the ground up um, down in Charleston, South Carolina by the Gotcha team down there. Um, a couple great features like Brian mentioned, um, seven speed bikes, um, so these are all, you know, pedal power, seven speed bikes, um, starting from the front here, lights on both the front and back. Um, the great things about these with the going to these smart bike systems is having everything right here on the bike. Um, so with the ability to have all of the brains of the system right here on the bike, it makes things very easy for users. They can go right up to the system, enter in their account and pin number right here on the back of the bike um, and utilize this lock system. So these U-locks are very versatile. They can be locked to both our green ride system hubs as well as basic um, bike racks as well around town. Um, the basket on the front with some safety information for anyone who can't really see. Um, some safety information and some uh, branding from our friends by Blue, Cro Blue Cross Blue Shield in the front there. Kevlar seats, um, they are rust proof so they can really withstand uh, the elements out there which is a great option, especially around here. As we've seen over the past few weeks, it's nice to not have to worry about having our bikes out there. Um, we do have our operators on the ground who are responsible for going out, helping clear off some of the snow and ice, but these things are very sturdy bikes. Um, like I mentioned, Kevlar seats and the U-Lock smart locking system and computer and brains of the bike right in the back here. Nice and light bikes well as well, aluminum frame right around 40 pounds for those. So very nice, versatile, sturdy bikes. And moving on. I'll let you drive it. Cool. Yeah. So that is the bike. Obviously, um, you guys have probably seen them around town. We have them currently branded with both Ben & Jerry's and 7th Generation, our two title sponsors. Um, the hubs themselves, you guys have probably seen these around town. Um, they are a regular U-Rack hub system, very flashy with the nice green branding on there. Um, each hub is either a freestanding sign or we can actually put signage panels on a local building or structure around any of our hubs as well. Um, the signs themselves include a local map, some system information, as well as some of our sponsor branding on there as well. Um, the great thing about utilizing a smart bike is that these hubs can move around and we also have the ability to geofence virtual hubs as well. So if we have any sort of special events, if there's anything going on around town or we want to designate a specific area, we can actually go in on the back end, virtually geofence an existing public bike rack and it then becomes a green ride bike share um, rack and there are none of the fees associated with locking the bikes or leaving the bikes outside of one of our hubs. Um, so a lot of versatility there. Um, our current phase, uh, this is a little map of our system at the moment. In place for phase one, we have 105 bikes on the ground at 17 hubs around town. This is a little bit seasonal. As we come into the winter, we're still sort of finalizing our winter plan. This will be our first winter for the system. So as we go, as the weather continues, we will be pulling some bikes um, out of the system as well as a couple of the hubs. Our Ben & Jerry's hub downtown is already out of place, so we are currently running with 16 for the winter months. So that's sort of an ongoing process, figuring out how the bikes and the hubs will play out throughout the year. Um, we, again, like Brian mentioned, we have these hubs both in Burlington, South Burlington, and Winooski. Um, our main focus with our system that we have in place, we really are trying to push this for residents, commuters, and employees. We are really looking um, to make this a local commuter option and a great um, local sustainable transportation option for residents. Um, obviously, there, are, there is a lot of tourist use during the summer months. 
um, but our main focus with this program is really trying to push towards a sustainable transportation option for locals. Looking ahead to some further phases, we are in the process of working our way through our second phase, which will roll out this upcoming spring um, with, a set with phase two, and then ahead to phase three. Our second phase, we are looking at moving up to somewhere around 25 hubs with the implementation of um, a few more bikes, bringing us to around 200 bikes for phase two. Eventually looking ahead to phase three, we are looking at around 300 bikes at 45 hubs. Um, the big goal of this program is to make it a regional system. It's very easy for a lot of people to say the Burlington Bike Share Program. We don't like that, uh, we don't like that name because we really are trying to make this a regional program. So moving out to some of our sort of uh, towns outside of the Burlington area, looking at you know, some more areas in South Burlington, Winooski, and then expanding out to Colchester, Essex, Wilson, Shelburne as well. Um, how much does it cost? This is a little breakdown of our costs. You can see we have multiple um, membership options and payment plans as well as our quick trip option. So if a user is coming up, they don't want to sign up for a monthly or annual plan, they can walk up to one of the bikes. You can reserve both online or through our app. We'll get into a little bit more detail on that in just a second. Um, it's $2 to unlock the bike um, and then you're paying $5 every 30 minutes. Um, after that first 30 minutes of so that $2 unlock for a quick trip. Our monthly and annual memberships, uh, the monthly is $15 a month, the annual $50 a month. That also gets you 60 minutes of free ride time a day. So again, as we are really trying to push this towards locals as a commuter option, um, looking towards those monthly and annual plans is a great option for people getting to and from work, if they're getting off the bus and need to go to the grocery store, you name it. Um, with those plans, like we said, 60 minutes of free ride time per day. Uh, Ryan touched quickly on the Green Ride for All, our equity program. That is discounted uh, both monthly and annual memberships for people who uh, qualify through the Vermont EBT card holders, um, as well as discounted campus plans and discounted plans for CAPMA members as well. How does it work, the nitty gritty? So there are, like Brian mentioned, there are a couple of ways that you can get yourself access to these bikes. If you do not have a smartphone, you don't have access to a computer, you can actually sign up for one of the payment plans through our partners at Old Spokes Home. You can also sign yourself up for either a quick ride or one of our payment plans via the <coughs> website, or you can utilize the SOBI, the Social Bicycles app. On that Sobe app, it will give you a map. It will show you where all the bikes are in our system. You can reserve a bike through there, or you can simply walk up to um, a local hub um, where you have some bikes available. Once you have signed up for either a Quick Trip or one of the payment plans, you are given a uh, account number and a four-digit pin. The four-digit pin just goes right into the back into our computer system, right on the back of the bike. The, it releases the U-bar. You can unlock it from the hub, and then you're ready to go. Um, once you are out and riding, we, all, these bikes also have a hold option, which is a, a great option for people who may be biking around, want to stop for a cup of coffee. All you do is find a place to lock the bike, hit hold, and it gives you half an hour um, of time to go inside, grab a cup of coffee, whatever it may be. Um, that does account towards your total ride time as well. When you're finished with your ride, um, we highly encourage people to return the bikes back to one of our actual hubs, but you do have the option of also locking the bikes to a bike rack outside of our hubs. There is a fee for an out of hub and then also a charge if you end your ride outside of our system map as well. Um, so we do highly encourage people to return them to our hubs. But like we said, with that hold option, it gives people a little bit of freedom if they are biking around, want to grab a cup of coffee, pop into a shop quickly. Um, it adds a little bit of versatility for their rides. Going into some details on what we've seen so far. So our system launch was in mid-April. Since then, we have had close to right around 587 active members um, throughout the past six months. Uh, close to 900,000 calories burned. Our average ride time is right around 18 minutes. The average distance is 1.78 miles. Um, so the great thing with these systems, use, utilizing SOBI, is through our back end, we can pull a lot of data out of each individual bike, um, which helps gives us, gives us a really great picture of how the system's doing, where certain bikes may be, um, any problems that, we may, uh, that may arise in the system 
can all be accessed right through our back end. That uh, image on the right there, that is a heat map, which we can access through our back end as well, which kind of gives us a live play on how the bikes are moving around the system. And as you can see, we're really happy to see that these bikes are really being utilized almost everywhere in our system map. Um, you can see an almost perfect uh, layout of the city grid. Um, even some people going out to the airport as well, which is great to see. Um, so we've been pretty happy with the system so far. There definitely is some room to grow, um, but we have been uh, pretty happy with some of these numbers so far. And that, you know, I'll jump in that, that member number of 587, you know, those are monthly and annual members. You know, there's yes. 3,000 people that just did pay-as-you-go, or yeah. at least 3,000 pay-as-you-go trips. Um, with this data on the back end as well, we can also look at how our hubs are being utilized. So we just pulled some of the statistics uh, from this past summer, looking through June to August. As you can see, a lot of usage down at the waterfront um, and dispersed a little bit through the college campus and some downtown as well. So this is showing where bikes were leaving from and where they were returning to. So as you can see on that right side at the waterfront, that was a lot of leaving from the waterfront, returning bikes back to the waterfront. Our other hubs had a lot more traffic going to and from other hubs. As the students have come back, as you can see, that changes a little bit. Um, a little bit less usage on the waterfront and a little bit spaced out um, system-wide as well. So a lot more usage on the college campuses um, and a little bit more um, in our... In the library. Yeah, yes, that is our, that's our hot spot right now. Um, so a great thing, you, being able to look at all these numbers is we can sort of track as the year goes on, where are the bikes ending up? Um, it can really help us look into the health of our hub locations, which will be a really key player as we're looking towards our second phase, evaluating our current hubs that we have in the system and looking ahead to implementing more hubs, <coughs> moving some of our current hubs around. A lot of these numbers are very, very helpful um, for some of these studies. A lot of questions around bike share are always floating around there. The big one is always helmets and safety. Um, safety is obviously a really major concern for all of us in the mobility and transportation industry. Um, it's sort of been a, a big uh, head scratching question for all the bike share programs out there. We are looking forward to trying to do some partnerships with the possibility of some local shops. Anytime people sign up, if we're ever having a membership drive, when people are signing up, we are handing out free helmets. Um, so we are definitely looking for some ways to improve our safety um, standards with bike share. Just a little bit more education and just getting some more helmets out there. Um, the hills, as Brian mentioned uh, when they were talking about bringing these bikes in, we do have a lot of hills around here. That is a, uh, always a little bit of a drawback for some people. It can be kind of nerve-wracking when people see a huge hill in front of them. Luckily, these seven-speed bikes uh, can get up and down these hills pretty well. And looking ahead um, to our next few phases, we are looking at the possibility of uh, rolling out some e-assist bikes um, and the e-scooters as well. Um, Obviously, weather and rebalancing here in Burlington. Being on a big hill, a lot of the bikes, it's really easy to take a bike from the top of the hill, cruise down towards the waterfront. When you turn back around and look back up the hill, some people choose to uh, take another form of transportation. So as we're looking ahead to some of these uh, future phases, um, that's where we really see the e-assist bikes um, coming into play, um, to have a healthy system that can rebalance itself as opposed to having um, members out there spending time rebalancing the bikes themselves. Um, do, do you want to mention? Yeah, I can jump in this. So uh, in the FY19 annual work program, uh, the RBC has put aside some funding to study um, phase one so far, and we've been dragging our feet a little bit because why start a study in July when you just launched it in April? So we wanted to have enough time uh, to gather some data, not only over the summer months, but also when the students are back. Um, so Tool Design Group is one of our pre-qualified consultants. <coughs> uh, I had a phone call with them today to go over the draft scope and talk about some of the things that we really want to make sure we're covering. Are the stations in the right place? How many more bikes do we need? What's the usage look like? What are the positive metrics we want to be hitting? And so on and so on. So that will be taking place over the next couple months. I expect that not to take very long. Um, it's not a bridge scoping study, so it shouldn't take a year. <laughs> uh, and that's great. Um, we did apply for and were awarded a uh, bike ped grant from the state to help expand the system. Again, I mentioned we're just using URACs. 
And so we applied uh, to a grant to um, basically double the number of URACs that are available. So we can decide based on this study, do we need to uh, cash in that full grant and double, or do we only need um, a little bit of it at this point? Um, to, you know, are we going from 17 to 25 or 30, or are we going from 17 to 34? Um, but that's great that we have that support, um, that people see the value in this and are willing um, to support our expansion at this point. Um, yes, yeah, so looking ahead to these expansions, um, Gotcha, our partners down in Charleston, they are just putting the final touches on their e-scooters. Um, so they have built their own personal e-scooter from the ground up. Um, which is quite different from a few of the other brands out there. Very sturdy scooter um, that is an electric scooter as well. So there is the option of rolling some of the scooters out in future phases. Um, there's obviously a lot of question marks that come around um, the talk of scooters. So there are still some, uh, some planning pieces and uh, some question marks around the scooters and how they will be implemented into the system uh, going forward. The great thing with um, the gotcha system is that as they are looking ahead to systems come around spring, um, everything will be centralized right through a gotcha app. So they will no longer be using the SOBI um, computer systems. It will all be utilized right through one gotcha app. Um, so if there are multiple transportation options on the ground in Burlington, people can go right through one app. They can see where the bikes are. They can switch over to see where the scooters are. Um, so it really makes it very user friendly um, to just centralize that all through one, one application. Um, we're really looking forward, Brian mentioned, about the Green Ride for All program. Um, it's a sort of a big passion project for myself. I just came on board for the system uh, sort of mid-October. Um, so doing a little bit more work behind the Green Ride for All and our equity programs is a little bit of a passion project for myself. Um, and we are really looking to sort of expand both education and some of our outreach um, to, you know, really get this system in place for locals um, as an alternative transportation option. Um, and we were also recently uh, awarded another grant. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mentioned the health benefits, right? You get on a bike, you're active. It feels good. It's good for your health. Um, and so I had read about, I think it was in Chicago, they had this similar type of program and we applied for a state council on physical fitness grant to pilot that program here. So basically we're gonna to try to find a network of doctors who are willing to write uh, prescriptions, if you will. If physical activity will help whatever condition you have, they can give you an annual membership to Green Ride Bike Share. Not only can we track that person's usage on it, but when they go back for their follow-up appointments, uh, you know, we're hoping to see blood pressure drops and you know, that's what we wanna see. Um, so we were awarded that grant to pilot that. Um, we banned them from the e-assist bikes. <laughs> you know they're still so you know there's two different kinds of bikes, right? It's only assist. It's assist. Yeah. It's yeah. not an e-bike. Yeah. There's no throttle on it. You still have to pedal. Um, there's still a benefit to being out there pedaling. Um, so we're excited about that. That will get started on uh, probably at the beginning of the year uh, and get that going on. And then overall, we just want to get more people on those bikes, right? We want to get ridership up and membership up. Um, and that heat map, I love looking at that heat map from a planner's, you know, through my planner's lens. People are riding everywhere. It's fantastic. So when towns are wondering what roads should we improve, all of them. <laughs> the annual uh, membership, do you get to have the 356 hours, however you use it? It's an hour per day. Right? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so you get yeah. 60 minutes of free ride time per day. And that can be utilized to, you know, Go you use it or lose two it. hours one day and you use it or lose it no so it does not roll over. oh it doesn't roll <clears throat> use it or lose it right. could you talk a little just a little bit more about the finances because it sounds like private sector sponsors got things going uh, then you talked about a grant I don't think was that a public sector grant I'm just trying to see right. where is this five years down the line this is cost neutral to the municip municipalities but you know, 10 years, if it's a fully functioning vetted system, how, how is the revenue going to come in to pay for that, assuming that the rides themselves are not going to cover the cost um, for doing the that? The goal ultimately is to have enough ridership to support the system. Um, it may <coughs> take a little while to get there. Um, it was private sponsor dollars that got us off the ground. However, UVM Medical Center, UVM, Champlain College, 
also contributed. Uh, we did we did ask for municipal sponsorship as well, um, which hasn't quite come to fruition. Uh, although we do have a signed agreement with Burlington at this point, but based on how Gotcha is looking into the future about um, expansion, they don't need that. They don't need the financial support from the municipalities anymore. So it is. Is it comparable to like the bus system where we should just expect, especially if you're a little bit further out of the core, that you're going to have towns. Towns will need to support this. I'm not saying it's not worth supporting. It sounds like pretty good stuff. But where do you, would you suspect that it's ultimately going to continue to need to be sort of subsidized to, to keep going? It's too early to say that. Yeah, I think I it's and, not, You know, this, this analysis uh, study that I mentioned that we're looking at, that's one of the, the tasks is what, you know, what does that future revenue look like? We, what do we need to be doing um, to be cost neutral? A follow-up question: Are there examples of bike share programs that are self-sustaining in terms of revenue from riders? There, it, within the Gotcha system, luckily they've had a lot of um, we've had a lot of great programs at university levels that have been very self-sustaining through ridership, through memberships, and payment plans. Through especially the universities, Gotcha themselves sort of specialize in universities they really got their start in university marketing and then rolling out mobility options at universities obviously un universities are a little bit smaller scale they're really only implementing those systems and really putting money into those systems during school months when they have thousands of kids around at a at a university um, so scaling that up to municipal systems um, Bike ride at this level, especially with the utilization of the smart bikes and on this scale, as of right now, we're hoping some of these studies that we are rolling out right now will kind of will kind of show if just the ridership dollars are really viable to to fully fully fund some of these municipal systems. And the other major companies that you're probably hearing about are not self-sustaining; they are venture capital backed, yeah. and so they're just throwing bikes out there. They've got money behind it, but at some point, when the money's gone. We've already seen that from some of the Chinese companies. Okay, I'll ask the question that's in the room. How much does our program cost? Um, we, it's, so it was a three-year lease with Gotcha that was a little over $200,000 at the Four time. three years, sir? Uh, each year. Each so year. It, it was, I should know this off the top of my head because I looked at it enough, but a little over half a million dollars for the three years. However, when we built that budget, it included electric assist bikes which we don't have. <clears throat> Are we renting the bikes from them? We're leasing the bikes. They're leasing right. the bikes. So they own them, they're getting the depreciation and everything else. Yeah. Okay. It is a per, per bike cost model. And how much of the $200,000 annual cost through the first few months has been generated by user revenue? I don't know what the revenue is. because 10%, 20%? Five percent, one percent. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you exactly what the rider revenue. We did a back so like. yeah. The financing part of it is interesting uh, because Gotcha is the private company and they get to see all that stuff, and we can do back of the envelope calculations based on the ridership numbers and what we're charging. Um, so they get the revenue from the riders. We have been trying to claw back as much as we can, and they're they're a willing partner. When we started this, we said everything that we make on this system, we want to go back in the system to expand it as quickly as possible. And they said we get it. How about this? And we said no. How about how about a hundred percent? So we're trying to work on that revenue share so that we can continue to build the program. And and they're they've been a good partner. They are totally willing to work with whatever we're after. Then the last question is, um, is it reasonable to think that we could get to some kind of stabilized financial model in five years, 10 years, I think so. three years. Okay, yeah, so, so five years from now, if we're sitting here and we're not in a stabilized financial model, we're looking at some other way to get to generate the sources. Right. I think if the sponsorship dollars isn't, if the private dollars aren't there to support it and the ridership isn't there to support it, um, I don't know why <clears throat> public dollars would, I, I, I don't know. It's a great question. And, you I'm, know, I'm what feeling I, like Wayne. I'm getting CCTA. Yeah, flashback. it's right. and you know I've, I've mentioned how quickly everything changes. You got to get rid of that hill, then everything changes. <laughs> you know, that's what we're trying to do. I think if that might be expensive. The electric assist bikes. I think that will get more people on the bikes. If you've ridden electric assist bike, you're like, 
I get it. Oh, that's right. So if we can get 200 of those bikes on the ground, we're going to see more ridership. Yeah, and with that second phase, you know, rolling out with e-assist bikes, we are hoping that moving towards that model will really increase that mm -hmm. rider revenue um, with increased rides, just a little bit more easier access and increasing that ridership. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get more towards that rider revenue. Well, here, here, but I, I also wanted to ask, you had a, a, a data point for the pounds of carbon dioxide um, that had been reduced. Is that actual measurable people chose to ride the bikes as opposed to take the car? I mean, how are you measuring that? So that is, that is calculated through SOBI, and they take those numbers, sort of calculating the mileage versus both ridership. I think it's sort of a metric on both cars and bus transportation and somehow on that back end when they are calculating our trips, mileage, number of rides per day. But not walking. They're there, if yeah. somebody rode a bike instead of walking, that's pretty carbon neutral. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. So I think, I think all of those numbers that they are spinning out for that pounds of carbon saved is versus driving a yeah. car. Just like the but dogs. you don't know the whether the person, is there a way with that smart hub there on the back to say, you know, just a little survey. Is this instead of driving, or I don't know, some way to to measure? There is there is that possibility. I mean, we are hoping that <coughs> with all these ridership, we are you know, especially looking towards making this a sustainable transportation option. Is mm -hmm. we are hoping that it, that as locals utilizing these bikes <coughs> as opposed to taking a, taking their vehicle downtown. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe more bikes on the road will do that because people would prefer to get on their bikes when they see 100 bike riders in front of them. I'll get on one too, right? So there is something yeah. to that mass, you know, that critical mass that's needed to really change people's right. behavior. You need to go to China. So can I ask you a question about that? Because the bikes are located closer to where people work. How do you use that to commute? Like, can you actually take it home at night and bring it back in the morning? Like, you can. There's a fee associated. Well, then you're with paying for that number house. of hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. so well, you're paying. You're not paying for the number of hours. You're paying when you lock it either out of a yep. hub or out of a system. So it's one set out of hub lockup fee. So you technically could bike at home. You are, and it wouldn't charge you for that whole time that you have it. It would charge you for just if as long as it is in the system, it is only charging you an out of hub fee. So if you're so willing it's not per to, hour fees. So fee? if you do the fifty bucks for the year. What's the what's, uh, out of hub? It's $5 for an out of hub, $50 if you're out of system. Out of system, what are the, what, tell me like the, the range of. Yeah, there's of a, a system boundary, so yeah, a few so bikes try to map. If you like down If you leave it on Webster Road in Shelburne, you're going to pay an annual fee. Charlie, optimally, it sounds like if like a bus stop. Bus stops can only be finite, so. Bicycles also have a hub. If you can walk a certain distance to it, jump on your bike, put it in another hub, walk a little distance, it will take you a place the bus won't. And I look at it as kind of a adjunct to the whole public transit system. And, yeah. and it all has its, you got to get from where you are at least to wherever the dock is for the most part, whether it's a bus stop or a bike rack or whatever. Yeah, when you saw that map with all the little pins about the, you know, phase one, all the gaps, the Old North End, the South End, Winooski, we know we need more of those, but we could only oh. the amount of money that we had to get those bikes on the ground. So we, you know, we already know, and the study will help us inform specifically where, but where those additional stations can go. So having, doubling the fleet of bikes <clears throat> and adding stations and people choosing to accept that five dollar, or we may choose to drop it down, to, you know, a dollar. Sure. I, I think the unspoken stuff here, because I made the bad joke to start the conversation off tonight, but it's uh, if you're going to be seen as a, a modern city, a modern community, there are people that will choose to live there, go to school there, work there, do whatever based on whatever it is that they feel they need. This is this kind of thing is becoming very usual mm -hmm. um, in big modern places that people actually want to live. And if we're going to, to me, it has an advantage of just being one of the options that people look for when they make bigger decisions, which actually adds to the economy. Um, so this is a, um, I'm really happy to see that we've jumped on this bandwagon. I think it's uh, just the way the future is going to be. Awesome.
Thanks for, uh, we probably took up more of the time we were allotted, but thank you for uh, listening to that. I know we've been working on it a lot behind the scenes and we wanted to share that uh, with you. Thank you very much. I can see Appreciate a new definition it. of park and ride. We evolve, we don't stay the same. <laughs> the next item on our agenda is an introduction to the I-89 2050 study, which will begin in fiscal year 19, which as we learned earlier is but a I will be dead moment in time when it comes to transportation. <laughs> so Eleni, you're going to yes. guide this discussion? Excellent. <laughs> well, I did have somebody live to be 103 in my family, so maybe. There you go. You might be still around, yeah. Jeff. Um, I'm just going to give you a very brief update, and maybe, maybe not. If this is not. <laughs> That's not showing the same thing you're looking at? Yeah, no, it's not actually. I'm looking at mine. <laughs> and let me just try to see if I can take this off. So, a very brief overview. I uh, won't take a lot out of your time because we're still at the very beginning of this study. We're actually in the midst of trying to procure a consultant at the moment, so we haven't really started. But it's going to be a very, uh, it's going to be a multi-year study, probably two to three years, probably three years. And uh, to be honest, and uh, shoot for two, but. Be realistic, it may Be turn into three. Be realistic and, and say three from the very beginning. So, um, so just to remind all of us why we're doing this study, uh, you saw this slide like last year when we were developing our Metropolitan Transportation Plan numerous times. But this is uh, what we came up as our 2050 MTP investments. So one of the recommendations out of the MTP was actually to just uh, conduct a study, a corridor study, as well as some scoping elements with this that's corridor study for um, the uh, I-89 corridor. And we were thinking back then between exits 12 and 16, but through discussions with veterans, we actually decided to just look at the entire interstate corridor in Chinon County, as well as uh, the interchanges within the urban core. Mm. So, uh, and we're doing this because uh, when we did the MTP, the MTP and the regional plan are a high level planning. Uh, and, you know, we run our model and our model said that we needed, for example, a third lane of the interstate between exits 14 and 15. And that's again at the high level, at the modeling level, we really need to just go down and, and look at the corridor level and do a lot more evaluation analysis to figure out exactly what we need to do with the, inter with the interstate itself, the main line, as well as specific interchanges um, around uh, South Burlington area. So you saw these slides too. I just left them here because uh, it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. This is modeling outputs that we did last year. Uh, last year, yes, it was last year. And uh, <coughs> so this, what you see here is basically congestion. So this is roadway capacity in the, more like the urban core of the county. And yellow is, indicates very light congestion and goes all the way to purple, which is very severe congestion. It's, it's uh, the V over C ratio, it's above one, it's over capacity is where traffic stops. So this is 2015, this is our base year that we looked at at the model. So this is our 2050. Base. And what it mean by that is that if we don't do any transportation investments in 2050, but we still have the growth in population and employment, which brings more traffic, uh, then we're going to have this uh, capacity issue on the interstate between 14 and 15 northbound. So uh, one of the investments then, that, that lead us to basically look at different investments. Uh, you know, not only for the interstate, for the, for the whole county. So one of the investments was to actually have a third lane on the interstate between 14 and 15, and uh, plus a number of other investments. We had investments in uh, public transportation, in TDM, in bike and pet. We increased all the other modes to the degree possible. 
but we still needed to do this. But when we do that, this is our MTP investment. So all, the first slide that I show you with all those investments, uh, if we do all those, this is what we end up with. And as you can see, the congestion between 14 and 15 uh, went down, but we pushed the congestion <laughs> up to 16 and 17. So that's why this study, this I-89 study, is basically so important. We just need to take a much closer look, a much more detailed look about uh, what's going on and what are the ramifications of doing, um, you know, the, the different kind of like improvements. So overall, our goals for this study is basically, first we're gonna look at, we're gonna assess and evaluate the current conditions on the, on the corridor as well as uh, interchanges within the county. And we're gonna look at a bunch of different things and it's just, uh, you can see there that, uh, and this is just a partial list by the way, I couldn't put all of them there. So we're gonna do that for the current conditions and we are also gonna assess future needs uh, which includes you know, future land use, uh, employment, households, and then we're going to develop uh, alternatives. We're going to evaluate these alternatives. We're going to develop multimodal alternatives, especially for the um, for the uh, interchange um, areas. We're going to look at bike and pad. We're going to look at increasing uh, transit. We're going to look at capital as well as operational improvements, and we are going to look at everything else. Like you know, if um, especially the transportation and land use. Uh, interplay, it's, it's pretty important because if you add capacity to the interstate, it affects where people live. So it will affect the land use within Chittenden County as well as outside <coughs> Chittenden County, and we're going to have to look at that, and we are planning to do that. We're also going to look at you know, air quality, energy uh, consumption as we um, evaluate these alternatives. Uh, and at the very end, we are hoping to develop an implementation plan that is going to have multimodal, um, you know, uh, strategies, and where hopefully it's not going to be our long-term and capital, in, in you know, uh, you know, investments only. We would like to see some short-term, maybe with ITS, with technology to help us in the meantime, as well as medium-term. So that is the actual goal of this, uh, you know, uh, corridor uh, plan. Uh, it's going to be a plan and a study that has a lot of public participation and public participation by stakeholders. Uh, we're going to manage the study, CCRPC is managing the study, but we are going to have a technical committee that is going to help us with the technical um, issues as we move forward, which is going to be plenty because we have a lot of modeling, uh, macro level and micro level, micro simulations as well as running the regional model. Um, we are going to have an advisory committee to provide overall guidance, um, you know, policy guidance and oversight. And as you can see, the membership of that committee, the advisory committee, is very diverse. So we're going to have fun. Uh, so <laughs> we are. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. We're also going to have focus groups uh, that we go to, uh, with, I mean, they're not going to be sitting on the advisory committee, but we're going to be going to all these groups at crucial, uh, you know, stages in the study to get their input and, and basically get their comments on, on alternatives. And of course, we're going to have our general um, public meetings and workshops. So it is uh, uh, the public participation component of this study is, is pretty, uh, it's, uh, it's robust. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are in the middle of procuring uh, and hiring a consultant. We decided to do a two-step procurement process. Um, the first step is done. We advertise for a letter of intent and a statement of qualifications pretty widely. Uh, and that was back in September. The selection committee actually selected four firms. Uh, to basically, um, we, are, we asked them to respond to an RFP that we put together, so we're uh, uh, waiting for their proposal. So those firms are VHB, Stantec, WSP, and Clark Harbor and Associates. And we are now in, in step two. We developed the RFP uh, in-house, but we got a lot of comments uh, from VTrans and other partners which we incorporate into the RFP. And uh, we are, the proposals are due next week, Friday. And the selection committee, I set the meeting up today. So we are meeting in December 20th. 
And uh, we might or might not uh, ask the top uh, two consultants to come for interviews. We're going to have to decide. So we are really hoping that we're going to have um, a contract awarded uh, by February. We want to go to the TAC in February uh, with a recommendation. So that's a very brief overview uh, of what we're doing. And we're going to be coming back to you on a regular basis and giving you updates on all this. Just uh, for our work program, this is the biggest project in our work program. Uh, not not just this year, but probably for the next two fiscal years. Um, and so, uh, I get one thing just to note, um, well, to have that in the back of your mind, like it, it may end up depending on the cost proposals we get from these consultant teams, you know, reducing the amount that we have typically had for municipal partners. So the UPWP committee will have that information by the spring to factor that in. But the other thing I really want to say is um, a thank you to VTrans because I think um, VTrans is really committed to being a partner on this and you know it's not just the RPC go study that and we'll see what happens but we're really doing it together and it also I think expanded the scope a little bit because we probably got into some some of the asset management things that um, you know VTrans is concerned about about you know when are they going to have to replace the sub base of 89 which is something I hadn't thought about but you know that road is probably getting pretty close to 50 years old um, and you know they're having to repave it or do some sort of resurfacing every did, did I hear like every six years I think um, and so um, so that was just kind of a like interesting dynamic and so I think this will be a little uh, a little broader scope and more holistic um, and I think reflecting some some evolving philosophy at VTrans about Hey, if we're going to go in and fix something, if it's for maintenance, maybe we can improve it at the same time. Uh, or if we're going to do an improvement project, maybe we can incorporate the maintenance at the same time. Um, so it's, uh, I think this should be, should be fun. Should be Is fun. that the word you were looking? Yeah. yeah. Um, and already, you know, the, uh, the different partners, the, ca the cast of characters is very similar to what we did with the Cirque Alternatives. Um, and so, um, you yeah, know, I think we got to some outcome in that process. Um, and so kind of looking forward to going through, I don't know if we're really looking forward to all of the process pieces, but mm -hmm. looking forward to having a positive outcome. Um, a couple of pieces that Elaine didn't mention, you know, uh, another interchange was in our MTP. You know, we're not sure uh, if that's improving. You know, the, really the issues around exit 14 is where the, <laughs> the system is breaking down, right? There's no, no news to anybody. Um, and so, as, a question of can we improve exit 14 or is there something that needs to happen uh, and there you see like the exit 12b i think we ha we put into the plan as a placeholder but um 14n which is something the airport recommended which is you know can kind of a a new partial interchange i think mm -hmm. that would just kind of go over to the airport parkway uh, which is very close there um, on the south side of the winooski river also had the same kind of positive regional you know, traffic benefit in terms of relieving traffic at, at exit 14. Um, so anyway, there's a lot to look at there, and there's certainly a lot of other issues in towns as we go out to the to the ends too. So stay tuned. Um, you'll hear more. But you know, this the first few months are probably just going to be you know data gathering and things like that. Um, so I expect probably next fall is really where we start to have some conversations about what the future might look like. And sorry, Megan, I'm looking at you a lot because. Surprise! A lot of this happens in South Burlington, <laughs> so um, for, I don't know, for better or worse, but hopefully we get to the best possible outcome you know, for all the uh, issues included here. So, stay tuned. Can I add a oh yeah, sure. So uh, I think one of the most important things we talk about: how long does something like this take? Mm. This is we envision this is a very long term. We have to start this conversation now. To to have any ideas to what might in realistically be feasible at some point in the future, but we're not talking about major improvements in the near term. This is really a long-term project. So I just want to stress that with all of you to go in with your eyes wide open. Um, you know, as soon as this probably hits the press, we're going to start seeing people rising up and voicing opinions about even studying it and looking at it. Um, and so as this goes along, we'll get a much better sense of what kind of opposition support that kind of thing for <coughs> even looking at capacity and talking about potential improvements so 
um, just so everyone realizes this is really envisioned as a really a long term, but we have to start the conversation. We, if we don't start now, we're just postponing the reality that we're going to have to look at this at some point. So that's why we were willing to jump in and we're providing some additional funding to support the effort as well. So, um, yeah, I think Amy raised a good point. Like right now you saw, uh, the model was saying we're like 80% capacity mm -hmm. in that section where everybody or if, I, if we put out a poll, people would say, it's, it's already over capacity, widen it tomorrow, which is, we are sure to get that response. Um, and I think this is going to force us to focus on, well, what, what's actually happening? The, there isn't enough volume for that segment to really be over capacity, but what's really happening is they can't get off. It's the interchange, it right? So it, it's route two is where the issue is. And so we're going to have to think through those, and that's why I, I, I guess I've, I may be fast forwarding more than I should be, which I definitely am. But that's why, I like about the additional interchange, is not about you know providing more capacity. It's really providing more alternatives to get around the core of our region. So, but that's going to be a very tough conversation. Um, so, stay tuned. There will be more fun to have, to be had. And we share it with all. Thank you, VTrans, for being. Can I just in, ask what that new Colchester loop, recognizing that we're talking 2050? I'm just curious about. I think the Colchester loop there is the one that goes from North Avenue. It's a transit. It's a transit. It's a transit route. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I can, I can, I don't remember exactly where it's going, but yeah. I'm happy to. Uh, went a little bit too far in their own direction. Yeah, those up in the MTP recommendations. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, so, so transit. the transit enhancements actually they are pretty robust. I mean, it's 20 minute headways on all routes. Mm -hmm. We are, we increase transit quite a bit, and then I think that loop is goes through North Ave. Okay. Yeah. What is the interface between this process and other interstate related projects that are already sort of in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. Exit 16, exit 12. Yeah, right. We're going to take that into account. Is 17. You, 17? Is yeah, 17 is coming, yeah. We're going to take that into account, and we're going to just look at them when they're going to come online, right? Mm -hmm. 17 is 2022, exit 16 is hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so we will definitely, when we're modeling, we're going to model those. We're going to, uh, you know, basically put the improvements into the model. Is like this capacity. going to affect it may or may not, I have no idea what the answer to this is. Is this going to affect the timeline that would otherwise apply to these interstate related projects that were already in the pipeline? I think we're starting off with the assumption that we would hope not. And not unless there's like something unusual comes out of this that says, oh, there's a better answer mm -hmm. that wasn't thought of when we just looked at that spot. Um, but. We're not going in with that, with, or I should say we're starting with the assumption that things are staying on track that are already on yeah, the Those plans. projects are going to be in our base model, if that's, uh, you know, helping. You know, that's, that's the assumption. Well, and, and the only reason I ask this is, as luck would have it, um, VTRANS and consultants presented to the Williston Select Board earlier this week, and I, I wasn't there, but I watched it online. And they were talking about, we have a number of CERC alternative projects related to exit 12. And there was some discussion about pulling back a bit in light of some more system-wide analysis about what's going on. So, um, which may very well be the responsible thing to do, but I was just curious as to how these all sort of fit together that way. I mean, we need to think a little bit more about that, but, you know, my thought right now, and maybe it will change, uh, is that, you know, the ones that they are in the capital program and front of the book, or maybe d &E, we're going to say, like, exit 16, exit 17, those are going into the base model, and exit 12, it's, a, it's in the, um, at the end of the, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, uh, it's, it's in the, it uh, yeah, it, so it's a candidate project. So mm -hmm. those are not, we're not going to include, but hopefully we're going to just basically verify that we need those improvements and soon through right. this. There are, however, for instance, there is a uh, bike ped connection that was planned underneath um, 
the interstate bridge and an additional lane short of doing the whole exit 12 bit. And that was originally intended to be something that was going to be relatively quick, especially with a park and ride planned mm -hmm. on the south side of the exit. Um, and anybody who's been by there knows that there, I mean, people kind of pick their way through the weeds with cars going by both ways. It's not a, it's not an optimal situation at all right now. Um, so, it, so it's not all, I mean, I understand completely. You're not going to go ahead with a, whatever the, 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 the double out. diverging <laughs> diamond crossover <laughs> interchange, um, until this whole process is done, but there, I hope that there are other elements yep. that were part yes. of the circle alternative that aren't going to be pushed aside to allow this process to go yes. forward. That's, yeah. that's, that's my right. yeah. predictable so, moment on that uh, topic. Part of this also to look where the bri our bridges are on the interstate because I would think they're going to be the linchpins. Obviously, if you build a brand new bridge and then five years later you want to expand right. a lane, FHWA is going to look at you and say, we just put all this money into this bridge, go away. Um, so you really need to actually build yes. bigger infrastructure prior to adding lanes. I'm assuming that's all part of all of this. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Eleni. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can open up the other one. So uh, a few quick updates for me and then... Um, We'll see what your stomach is for a longer conversation um, about the legislative breakfast. Um, so uh, just to let you know, business office associate, um, I th think since our last meeting, although I can't re quite remember, we've advertised. Um, so we had a, a fiscal uh, assistant or financial assistant, sorry, um, who uh, resigned a month or two ago um, and with Bernie's pending retirement decided let's look for uh, somebody in between um, and so there's a, a job application can't can't be replaced but we are we are going to <laughs> we are going to manage through the change um, and so uh, we're interviewing right now so just uh, an update that we're uh, you know in the process of uh, to work with force to work with four for force <laughs> And Bernie in the short term, so so it's uh, we're kind of taking advantage of uh, having Bernie here for you know the first part of 2019 to be able to cross train and do stuff like that. So um, so I just there may be a new person on our staff by your next board meeting. So just heads up on that. Um, housing convening, uh, Regina, you want to give a quick update on that? Sure. Um, so I think most of you know we've been doing uh, about quarterly or more than that. Um, meetings of all of the housing committees uh, that we've got Thank in the region the really to sort of sit around the table and talk and share amongst them themselves. Uh, the last meeting we had was at the end of October and they talked about housing trust funds. Um, and we had about 28 attendees from eight of our municipalities, so <coughs> attended. And the next one will be at the end of January, probably. With the topic being? Potentially inclusionary zone. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I think we, uh, thank you to Regina and um, for doing those. We're I think have, getting really good participation from municipalities focusing on the housing issues. So um, if you haven't heard about them or, or want to plug in, please contact Regina. Um, item C, the UPWP. Uh, hopefully, you all saw that the uh, UPWP application has gone out to your municipalities. Um, we're in the process of uh, setting up different meetings with uh, staff, uh, primarily staff, maybe one for some of the rural towns like Underhill. We had a meeting with your select board chair this morning. <laughs> so, um, but we're setting up meetings to just kind of talk about applications and um, help towns. You know, partly it's helpful for us to know what might be coming uh, our way, and uh, but secondly, and more importantly, to help the towns, you know, kind of. Uh, sift through what to apply for and, and uh, if we can help them with the application. So um, if if you feel like there is something that you know, should be on the radar for your town, please let us know. If you think one of your staff is talking to us, <laughs> tell them to let us know. <laughs> Whichever way you want to go, uh, we'll work with you on that. Um, so legislative breakfast, um, 
uh, this this hasn't happened yet. Um, but um, I just thought I'd if we, since I thought maybe we'd have a few extra minutes tonight. I'm not not sure how if you feel like we do have a few extra minutes or not. You will tell me momentarily. <laughs> but I thought that um, I'd get a little bit of uh, input since this timing has worked out pretty well. Um, and so this is the general layout that we've gone through for the legislative breakfast. How many of you are going to be able to make it? Just a few of you. <clears throat> I'm not sure you've all registered yet, so you probably got an email from Emma this, this morning. Today. Coincidentally, you got an email from Emma this morning <laughs> asking you to register if you had I it. usually jump right on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, we usually kind of grounded them a little bit in the ECOS plan and those uh, circle of prosperity and how important it is to continue to invest in Chittenden County. Um, go through some data that will, these aren't all updated yet, but you know, uh, smart growth, we're doing well there. The building homes together, we've got second year data that needs to be added in here. Um, and then there's a few slides that we've kind of more stolen some things, not stolen. We're partnering with GBIC um, <laughs> on this. Um, the sharing, yes, there's the sharing process going on. Um, and so uh, we haven't touched base on if they want to, if there's any other different points of <coughs> emphasis than what we emphasized last year. Uh, but, you know, there's just, just this kind of the great sense of responsibility in Chittenden County to keep the economic engine going. Um, and then we provide even more data, the more economic type data, income tax, uh, retail and use tax contribution of Chittenden County, uh, grand list change. Uh, in Chittenden County versus Vermont. Um, employment, um, you know, which is really, you know, without Chittenden County or this, I should maybe say this labor market area, um, you know, this, the state of Vermont would be. Notice that the Burlington, South Burlington area line has fallen below the yeah, US average. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was um, that was a year or two ago. So we'll see if we can get updated data on this. Not any better. Not any better, yeah. Um, and these are percent changes. So, right, so it's our growth in employment growth has, sl has slowed, um, which is, yeah, maybe n not a good sign. Um, but that part, well, article was just a couple of days ago about that precise thing. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's, it, there's a lot of discussion about why it's happening. You know, because, for example, if a nurse at UVM Medical Center quits and they can't find somebody to replace it, that nurse, that's a lost job, but it's not because of economic weakness necessarily. So mm -hmm. this is part of the reason why we also got downgraded as our lousy demographics. And we don't have enough people to fill the jobs that are out there. Um, yeah, which I don't know. We haven't really focused enough maybe on uh, the aging cohorts. Um, uh, this again needs to be updated, but you know, 62% of the job um, growth has been in Chittenden County uh, statewide. So, uh, and then this is uh, Frank Coffey, who's the president of GBIC, has been chairing the State Workforce Development Board with some recommendations. Um, and then we kind of get into more of our uh, specific stuff. Um, again, this is a little bit old, so we can update it with uh, where we ended up with the MTP. This was pretty close. Um, feels too much. Feels like too much stuff. It feels like we're going to be pounding them. Yeah, with too much data. Yeah. yeah so what I did last year, and or, or, so what we did, since we all own this together now, um, <laughs> was we did take that data stuff and just have it as a separate handout. Would that be easier to do and not even spend time? Like, that like there's one or two of the big factoids that we want them to walk away with. Yeah, I think. Don't you guys think that? I mean, I, maybe three to five, but not like. I love 20 data, or and I was yeah. feeling like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. I mean, mostly what we want to do is we want to listen. That we want to put our emphasize our points, then, and then listen have some to discussion. them and offer to help them help us. Yep. What about the um, recent survey? Um, is that is that done now? Yeah, it is done. Yeah, there were some interesting things in there. Um, yeah, let me think about the how that might fit in. Um, and 
whether it serves a purpose in this. <laughs> so. Well, if you're, you're going to do surveys, you have to un interpret the data that it's telling you. With just, yeah. the, just the data without an interpretation really doesn't do much. So I'm not going to get into the modeling results, um, but we'll probably just let them know that this 89 study is coming. Um, then the water quality funding, I don't think, unless you have different thoughts, that this story has changed too much. Uh, it's still a pending issue for the legislature. Uh, this <coughs> just started to add this. Uh, so the Commission on Act 250 um, is coming out with some recommendations later in, well, two weeks. Um, and so we'll see, we, unfortunately we're having this yes. breakfast before the recommendations come out. So I think we'll just say we're very interested in this topic. You're presenting? We're not going to have like multiple presenters? Or are you and Frank going to present or what? What do you think? One person is a lot easier. Yeah, so last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It seemed to work okay for me to run through at least more time for discussion. You just give Frank the opportunity on the slides that yeah. you present to say, is there anything that you want to amplify, Frank? Yeah. Well, he usually sends Seth anyway, but <laughs> noted. <laughs> uh, so Act 250 change. Um, one thing putting on their radar um, is. I think th that there will be a, a, a request from the RPC statewide. So we have our a state association called VAPTA, from Association of Planning and Development Agencies, um, to increase the regional planning dollars that we get. It hasn't been increased in five years. Um, and so kind of, I think we'll make more of a value proposition about like, we're doing more uh, for the state and haven't really had <coughs> an increase here. Um, they had some special money for water quality and energy in particular, energy is ended, uh, the energy, extra energy dollars. So I think just I want them to be aware that they're going to hear requests from RPCs for uh, some additional funding. Um, Can you just clarify that your base RPC funding? Because you've gotten more in transportation. Yeah, this is the regional just planning funding. So this is a property, that. property transfer tax yeah. funding. Um, is what we're talking about. A portion goes to the general fund, the portion goes to Act okay. 200 planning, and a portion. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that that's ACB. clear yeah. that it's, so you're talking about specifically that. that. And, and okay. remember, when we increased the property transfer tax rate, that went to water quality. That was called the clean water surcharge. That's right. So we just got to be careful that we make sure that we don't propose <clears throat> something that somebody can dismiss easily because we don't know what we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, we'll give them a little update on the dispatch. Um, and then we kind of ended with some resources. I don't, I don't think I spent any time on this other to say, like, here's some links. Help you. Yeah, exactly. We are here. There's data. We have maps, uh, you know, transportation, land use, water quality stuff. Um, and we'll update this on uh, some of the current things. Um, they're working on some base. The water quality would probably stay the same, transportation, but some of the other things will update. Um, uh, so the policy <laughs> issues were really kind of transportation investment, water quality investment, maybe some increased investment in the RPCs to help with doing those things, including uh, energy also. Um, and, then, uh, and then the economic issues, which you know are just kind of like just our legislators, in, in when they go to Montpelier, <coughs> right, there's a funny dynamic we're all aware of, right? That, you know, the nice thing about being in Chittenden County is it's so close to Vermont. Um, you know, and that sense is very much there in the legislature. Um, and it has some funny perceptions about, you know, how all the money goes to Chittenden County. You know, we don't often talk about how much money comes from Chittenden County. Um, and so part of this, I think, is trying to give our legislators enough information to, you know, have some healthy discussion in the state house when those, you know, pro helpful, or anti Chittenden County one conversations of the come up. Things were is we had some raw data earlier about how much personal income tax, yeah. And yeah, all that kind of stuff. It's almost it's almost more instructive to say, this is what we account for as a percentage of the total, and this is how it compares to some benchmark like. We have 28.9 percent of the population, but we contribute 35 percent of right. the personal income tax. Something that demonstrates 
that we make an outside con contribution without beating it too hard because then people turn around and say, well, that's because, you know, you're Chittenden County and the only place where wages are decent is up there and you, just because of where you are. Right. Right. I mean, of course, the, we all know this, but the response to that is if you want to have the funds to invest in the rest of the state to bring it up, you can't be cutting your nose off to spite your face. Otherwise, we're just all fighting for crumbs from a smaller pie right. size pie. I, mean, I understand. But they don't understand that. Right. 35 miles down the interstate. Yeah. Are there any other issues or thoughts? Um, I, I do think to the point of other people, there is room, I think, here for um, if a, one of the towns wants to, you know, poke in on one of these issues, you know, let me know if you'd like to. Or um, we've invited uh, your the select board chair or, or city council uh, chair and uh, and your town manager or administrator. So if you think one of them wants to poke in on one of these issues, just to emphasize something or bring up a local perspective, you know, I, I do think those those additional voices are helpful beyond mine for sure. Going to the, what Amy was saying about you know making sure that it's the regional plan. Yeah. I'm wondering something like this right here, if we should separate out mm -hmm. the transportation projects from the planning. You know what I'm saying? So, because we do. We're, we we have the MP, uh, the MPO and the RPC, it's together. But there's different functions, and different funding sources. So maybe instead of you got water quality, bike, and then you get into energy, you know, you got a mix of transportation, non-transportation. Just wonder if it makes sense to put the transportation items. Together. <coughs> so it kind of lets the legislators know if they don't know that we do delve into all these different things and we have different funding sources I don't know if it, if yeah it might be able to do that the, the messy one is water quality <coughs> there's, there's money from DEC not messy the good one is water quality because there's transportation and DEC money in there but but other than that that yeah it's probably not too hard to do so you can do just RPC, like some relative you can like, do RPC MPO combined RPC MPO yeah, so yeah. yeah. yep How many slides do you have? You didn't put a number on them that way. You couldn't, didn't have to count them. I think I was trying to keep this to like. Uh, oh, 21 slides? That's way too many. <clears throat> well, not if I take the Even data the pieces out. Even if I take the data pieces out. Yeah, I think I, I, I'll give this like 15 minutes so that there is at least, you know, 20 something for conversation. Hopefully you'll MC that. Sure. <laughs> No when, I, when I run away from the mic, right. you'll pick it up. Any other thoughts or issues that you feel like we should bring up with the legislators that are maybe issues happening in your towns that these issues aren't touching on? I mean, not, I know there are other issues, but <laughs> maybe not RPC issues. Well, certainly people can follow up with you yeah. later, too. Yeah, if you have one, let me know. I'll be sitting with our people. In that yeah, right. Yeah, please come. I think I think it, we have been getting I think pretty positive. I think for those that have attended, it's been a very positive conversations with legislators, and it's a good time to connect. And we're not conflicting. We're not with conflicting with the, the bankers, bankers this, year. this year. <laughs> we don't have to share a breakfast table or anything. So right. we, Emmett spent a lot of time making sure we're not conflicting. Well, so it was great because some of them showed up at our breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda, we've got various and sundry reports uh, included. Are there any members' items or other business? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Will we adjourn? Second? Second. Okay. One, more, one more quick announcement. Um, oh. Bob Dale from Green Rides Bike Share left his cars out here on the counter and wanted me to let, let you all know that they're there if you want to snag oh, Excellent. All in favor of the motion to adjourn, say aye. 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 All opposed? Have a good evening, folks. Drive safe. Yeah, but if you just be up, yeah. You went an hour. Um, tell you what, if you. It's more than an hour. Oh, okay. I was going to say, write it down and I can forward you.